Good morning. You are now watching the live coverage of the sitting of the House of Assembly. The Speaker of the House just walked in, which means that the House has officially begun. We now turn you over to the Speaker. Let us pray. Almighty God, <clears throat> by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding. We, thy unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name to do humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations. And grant that we, having thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsel may be to the glory and thy blessed name, the maintenance of thy true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace, and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in the true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us forevermore. Amen. Announcements by the Honorable Madam Speaker. I am sure, though late, we are all aware that the month of October is observed internationally as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. In that regard, I wish to plead my support for such a worthy cause and perhaps in the future as we encourage all parliamentarians to do whatever part they can in the observation of October as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This month, we come to the end of, as well, Creole Heritage Month, and I am sure most persons have an enjoyable weekend and enjoy much Creole food. I wish to remind honorable members that in the continuing effort to help our displaced brothers and sisters in the neighboring island of Dominica, I appeal to honorable members for what, we, what is dubbed the bucket drive for Dominica, the Dominica bucket drive. I appeal to members that they contribute $50 so that the staff of parliament can put together buckets of cleaning supplies, much needed cleaning supplies. It is a small gesture, but nonetheless, a very notable one and a, and a welcome one for the people of Dominica. So I'm, encouraged, I'm encouraging parliament members and honorable members who are here present to ensure that you make the contribution so that we can purchase all the necessary supplies and put the buckets together. And I thank those who have already made the contribution and encourage those who, have, who are yet to make the contribution. I am in receipt of an apology from the honorable member for Viewfort North, who has indicated that he is unable to be with us today because he is out of state. Another apology was also received recently from the Honorable Member for Labry, who has indicated that although he will be here, he will nonetheless be late. I wish to report to Honorable Members that Mr. President and myself returned just about a week ago from a visit to Taiwan, where we were invited to participate in Taiwan's observation of the 106th National Day. It was indeed a very good visit, 
um, one of our first official visits were to the legislative yuan, which is their, their parliament. And it's not to scare honorable members, but this is a beautiful gift from the honorable um, president of the legislative yuan in the form both to myself and Mr. President, a gavel. So this beautiful gavel is actually as a present from President Su, the president of Legislative Yuan in Taiwan. Following our trip to Taiwan, we were, we also participated in the 137th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union. The Interparliamentary Union is the oldest and largest parliamentary union, um, notably so. It's been in existence since 1887 with headquarters in Geneva. We attended the 137th Assembly in St. Petersburg, Russia, and um, St. Lucia was welcomed because St. Lucia is one of the small jurisdictions or legislatures that um, the president of the IPU would like to welcome to the IPU family. One of the principal tenets of the IPU is that of democracy and they hold dear to that tenet of democracy and they work very closely with the United Nations in getting Parliament's involvement around the world to help in reaching the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. So, whilst I would like, whilst I would very much like the St. Lucia Parliament to become a member of the IPU, this is something that has to be decided by the Parliament of St. Lucia and I would encourage members to, at least it's favorable, I would prepare a document whereby I can circulate to members as to the benefits of being members of the Interparliamentary Union. Statements by ministers. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, fellow colleagues of Parliament. Um, Madam Speaker, I want to take the opportunity to, to really to report to Parliament and also to the people of St. Lucia, really the occurrences over the last several weeks. I'm quoted as describing the situation that has been the perfect storm and that is the combination of Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Jose, and Hurricane Maria. And that when you then also include that with the earthquakes that were taking place simultaneously in Mexico. So although Hurricane Harvey, Madam Speaker, did not necessarily impact our region severely, I know that in St. Vincent and in Barbado, Barbados in particular, there were several floodings, but Harvey obviously laid much damage to the state of Texas, and in particular to the city of Houston. And at this point, I really want to express my sympathies to the many St. Lucians who live in Houston for their losses and damage to their own personal effects. Um, I have, as Prime Minister, made three attempts, Madam Speaker, to visit Houston. Because on two occasions recently I have been in the state of Texas. And unfortunately, for one reason or another, that we've not been able to coordinate with the diaspora, either that it was too early, or in fact that they were now doing many issues themselves, and for personal reasons it could not happen. But my intention is to be able to visit um, our solution diaspora in Houston as soon as it's possible. And that also applies, Madam Speaker, to our solutions who visit, who live in St. Martin, in St. Croix in particular, we all know that we have a lot of St. Lucians who are living in St. Croix. But the fact is that Houston is a critical gateway for the Caribbean, not only for airlift, but obviously for cargo. And that Houston was literally taken out of commission for a period of time. 
Following Hurricane Harvey, Harvey, we had Hurricane Irma. And it's at this point, Madam Speaker, I really want to acknowledge the efforts and the work, particularly of the Secretary General of the OECS, Mr. Didikos Jules, who um, came to my office approximately two days prior to Irma hitting. And in fact, that I am chairman of the OECS and I'm also the lead prime minister in CARICOM for sustainable development and disaster disasters. Um, and that we were able to work with Sedima in making up some of the shortfalls that we were seeing in our plan. I must really congratulate Sedima for the works that they've been doing and particularly with some very limited resources. But the fact is, is the plans that we had were really concentrated on the emergency situations that existed within the countries. And what we saw was a lack of coordination on a regional level. So in fact, when Irma was first coming, it was proposed or it was projected that Irma was going to hit Antigua and St. Kitts. And so automatically, in our minds, that that brought Martinique and St. Lucia into play, Madam Speaker. And that's why we immediately had meetings with here in St. Lucia. And again, I want to thank um, the Chamber of Commerce, the Hotels Association, the Manufacturing Association, the Employers Federation, and the unions. And in particular, I want to thank the staff of SLASPA for moving so quickly to be able to do a quick audit of space here in St. Lucia. And Madam Speaker, that space really had more to do with if in fact we had to have St. Lucia being used as an evacuation point. Meaning that if in fact jets could not arrive into Antigua and to St. Kitts and that they had to ex ex extract people who were either hurt or tourists or nationals that needed to be evacuated, that they would not be able to do so, Madam Speaker. And so we immediately sent out notices um, to all the relevant airlines that St. Lucia would waive all landing fees and that our air traffic controllers would remain open for 24 hours a day, as long as it was necessary. We also were able to find how much space we had at the airports in terms of cargo, and we did the same thing at the seaports. So I was very appreciative of the work that Didicus Jules had done, and in terms of the anticipation of what was going to take place. Fortunately, Madam Speaker, fortunately for Antigua and St. Kitts, the impact of Hurricane Irma wasn't as severe as it was on Barbuda, as it was on Anguilla, as it was on the BVI, and certainly as it was um, on the Virgin Islands. Irma then continued a path up northwards and we saw that Puerto Rico was shut down while Irma was passing by and that preparations were being made very much in advance to be able to shut down Miami. So here it was, Madam Speaker, that this region um, was literally at the mercy of Irma because Irma by herself was going to shut down Miami. And we already saw that we had Houston already shut down. So it meant that rescue and resources had to come from the South, Madam Speaker. And I think that the help of Venezuela, um, the help of the Panamanians, and many of the other countries in the South are to be commended for what they did, particularly in helping with the evacuation of over, over 1,800 people in Barbuda, as well as being able to provide eventually supplies to um, Dominica. Immediately following Irma, Madam Speaker, was Jose, which initially was following the exact same track as Irma. So many of us were shuddering at the thought that countries that were already severely impacted, and I have to say to you, Madam Speaker, I had the opportunity to go to the BVI and to Anguilla, and I am still trying to understand in my mind the le what would have caused that level of devastation. Literally every leaf on every tree was gone. Boats were literally picked up as toys and spread all throughout the country. In fact, at one location, I would say to you there was over 300 boats literally piled on top of each other. That every single vehicle that we saw had either broken windshields or damaged cars. Um, and the country looked absolutely paralyzed. It was, it was just incredible and when you spoke to the people 
and this was almost six days after the fact, Madam Speaker, that many people were still shivering. And many people said that this was not just a hurricane, but it was a tornado. And how terrified most of them were. And, and literally, you could see that most people's homes were damaged. Um, Anguilla was equally, equally as damaged. Um, and then we had the opportunity um, to go up to Turks and Caicos. But Madam Speaker, then came Maria. And I want us in St. Lucia to truly appreciate how close Maria came to coming to St. Lucia. In fact, it was on track to go between St. Lucia and Martinique. And the other terrifying thing about Maria, Madam Speaker, was that it became, went from a thunderstorm to a category Hurricane 5 within 10 hours. In fact, in speaking to some people in Dominica who went to their home thinking that they were going to be confronting a thunderstorm, and then all of a sudden, within three hours, that it had been upgraded to a Category 3 hurricane, of which at that point they could do nothing. And then for it coming into Dominica and coming in as a Category 5 hurricane. And the fact is, is that the hurricane took a path where it affected everybody in Dominica. It literally went right down the spine of Dominica, from north to south. And when you went to Dominica, Madam Speaker, and saw the level of devastation, it is heartbreaking. Literally every house that we saw, it was out without a roof. Dominica, which is fondly referred to us as the nature island, had no rainforest. The trees laid bare. In fact, the trees had been bleached, almost white, which was from the salt water in the air that had taken place. That almost three weeks after the fact, Madam Speaker, the town itself was still not operational. In fact, the, minister, the treasury was operating out of the prime minister's office because that's where there was a generator. But the rest of government was not functional. That the only works in clearing the roads was the works of the different military forces from the, from the CARICOM that had come in and cleared those roads. And no work had even commenced on putting back the electrical wires. We already see and we see today that the, the port itself was congested in being able to handle the, the, number, the amount of aid and clearly benevolence that was being brought to the, the doorsteps of Dominica. But Madam Speaker, I had at every moment to be reminded how easily this could have been St. Lucia. And I'm not so sure, Madam Speaker, that the infrastructure that we have today here in St. Lucia would it in itself have offered us any further protection than what I saw in Dominica. The agricultural sector, the rivers, the landslides, people's homes, it was devastating. It was truly devastating. And while we were trying to get assistance from our good friends in Mexico, Madam Speaker, they themselves were affected by not one earthquake, but two, in which over 500 people lost their lives. And so we truly understood that our Mexican neighbors who wanted so desperately to help us, and I think that the evidence of Mexico's support to this region is there to speak for itself, but they themselves could not do it in their state of crisis. In addition to obviously devastating for, uh, Dominica, Obviously, Maria took aim on Puerto Rico. And I think today we still see the results of that on TV, where in fact, suggestions are, Madam Speaker, that it may take by Christmas in order for at least half the people to get their electricity back. I had the opportunity to meet with my colleagues in St. Martin and also my colleagues in the Virgin Islands. And every attempt to just get business open is what people are focusing on. I mean, where is it that you've heard that literally a country comes to a grinding halt and basically put on hiatus and that hope, hopefully to reopen for business in January? And Madam Speaker, while we are very grateful that the Lord spared us, but at the same time we must recognize the impact that this has had on even St. Lucia. The number of St. Lucians 
who lived and worked in those islands that were repatriating funds back to us. The opportunities for agriculture in terms of our farmers who were sending stuff to those northern islands, Madam Speaker. And no one knows when those countries are going to open up for business. But even more impactful, Madam Speaker, was what was happening with the cruise industry. The fact is, is that Puerto Rico is a major hub for us in the, south, in the southern part of the Caribbean. While Barbados is a hub for the cruise ships coming out of Europe, Puerto Rico is the hub for the ships coming out of the north. And what I mean by that, Madam Speaker, is if they cannot use Puerto Rico, it means the ships would have to originate it out of Miami. And the only countries that could be benefiting from that on a, what we call a seven-day cruise would be St. Kitts would be the furthest south that they could go to. So it means that the numbers of arrivals that we would be getting could potentially be thwarted by Puerto Rico not being open. And the situation in Puerto Rico, Madam Speaker, is very delicate. Puerto Rico finds itself in a major debt. In fact, people have described Puerto Rico literally being bankrupt. That they have $85 billion worth of debt, which they cannot pay. And given the um, regulatory framework in Puerto Rico, they cannot declare bankruptcy. And so they're stymied. So even before the U.S. government looks to try to assist Puerto Rico with the infrastructure, they have to resolve what they're going to be doing with the debt. And I say that to say to you, Madam Speaker, that Puerto Rico has managed to get the airport open, but in terms of the majority of hotels and certainly the attractions that existed in Puerto Rico, those are not open. And also the fact is Puerto Rico acts as a hub for some of the northern islands, and those northern islands are not open. So it means the volume of business going through the Puerto Rico airport, Madam Speaker, has been diminished significantly. Madam Speaker, I take my time to say all of this in order for us to truly appreciate what is it that we're facing. And this is a situation that there should be no political divide. And I certainly want to thank the leader of the opposition for his support when I've reached out to him in terms of keeping him abreast and certainly his commitment to say that this is not about politics. But we also must be equally supportive and focused on how we're going to build resilience in St. Lucia. And I say this to you, Madam Speaker, that when I sat in my office and we started putting these efforts together, that we recognized that there was going to be a small window of opportunity for us in the Caribbean. The leader of the opposition hopefully would support me in saying that we in the Caribbean have been crying in the wind for a long time. We've been complaining of the fact that the OECD and the ODA, which is the Organization of Development Agencies, have basically classified countries into low income, middle income, and high income, and have used only one indicator to make that, determine, that determination. And that indicator has been per capita income. That's it. So because the Caribbean islands have a higher per capita income, we have been classified as middle income countries. In fact, Antigua is on the verge of being graduated to becoming a higher income country. And we have been arguing, both sides and everybody in the Caribbean, that this is unfair. And that we as SIDS, as small developing states, ought to be classified by what we call a vulnerability index. In fact, I must commend the work that was done by the Commonwealth Secretariat in trying to put this vulnerability index together. So if I give an example, Madam Speaker, if you take the British Virgin Islands as an example, prior to the hurricane, they had a credit rating of A-. In fact, if you went to the World Bank and the IMF, they would probably hold them up as model countries that you ought to follow. But that financial security offered no resilience to the hurricane. So in fact, you went from a GDP of over a billion dollars US, and I dare say that the BVI would be struggling to have a GDP of $250 million in eight hours. So when we say that you can, can't use just one classification, 
one indication, one indicator to make that determination. We have gone to meeting after meeting after meeting. Madam Speaker, many St. Lucians would have heard the name COP. And again, the world came together in Paris, I think it was in 2016, Madam Speaker. And there was a huge euphoria at the fact that we were able to sign this agreement. And this agreement basically, Madam Speaker, was really two components. One, that the world had given a commitment to try to prevent the, the warming of the, of, the, of the earth to exceed one and a half degrees. So it was, the cry was one and a half to stay alive. And the second part was that we we're going to put together a fund of $100 billion, Madam Speaker. And that that fund would be divided into two parts. One was called mitigation, and the other one was called adaptation. And I want to take this time, Madam Speaker, to, to define what those are. Mitigation, Madam Speaker, is to do things that are going to reduce the emissions into the hemisphere. The things that we would physically undertake to be able to prevent the warming of the globe by more than one and a half, half degrees. Adaptation, on the other hand, Madam Speaker, is accepting the fact that we are going to see some global warming, and as a result of it, there is going to be a rise in the acidity in the water, there's going to be a rise in the water levels, and that more than likely we're going to see stronger and more frequent storms. And so therefore, those monies would be used to assist countries in being able to build resilience. So building resilience, Madam Speaker, would be things like I think it is an accepted now that we must put all of our cables underground. Our communication lines, our electricity lines, all must go underground. This is not an option anymore. That we must build bigger drains in order to be able to capture the water. That we now need to strengthen the banks of our rivers and we have to raise the height of our bridges. Because if we don't strengthen the banks of our rivers and we don't raise the height of our bridges, what happens, Madam Speaker, is the same thing that we see take place every year. In fact, Malgratut in Miku is a classic example, Madam Speaker, in which the water will come down the river, it gets blocked by the bridge, the sea level rises coming from the ocean, and so between the water now departing from the banks of the river and the water coming back up from the ocean, you end up creating a whirlpool. So that's why you'll go there and you'll see trees bent one direction on one side of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the farm and bent in a completely opposite direction on the other side of the farm. And you ask yourself, how is that physically possible? But more importantly, it is the water coming out of those riverbanks that truly causes the irreparable damage to our environment. Our banana trees break. But if they just break, within four to five months, they've respouted. And so therefore, you lose the income for those four or five months. And it's easy to say that we can get an insurance program in place, Madam Speaker, to cover that loss. But when now the water comes out of the river, and it literally rips out the roots of the banana tree, we're now talking about 14 to 15 months. And we're talking about a substantial amount of more money in order to be able to recover the situation. So resilience is critical. We have argued on both sides, on the global arena, that for us as small developing states, the only solution is resilience. Because it doesn't matter what level of mitigation that we take, Madam Speaker, we can never be in control of our own destiny. It is only the larger countries of the world that have to make that commitment, Madam Speaker. So we have continued to argue that the only way moving forward is we must get funds available to be able to build resilience. The dilemma that we faced prior to this perfect storm, Madam Speaker, was that while there was recognition what we were saying was correct, the $100 billion has not been manifested. In fact, it remains a number on a piece of paper, a wish list, a hopeful number that we might be able to get. But we've seen no indication or no signs that the world is committed to this. In fact, the United States' withdrawal from the COP agreement 
is a proper another indication that the likelihood of us making a hundred billion dollars is not very strong. So I say this to you, Madam Speaker, that when we sat there as Irma was coming, we recognized that there was an opportunity. An opportunity to go one more time because now not only did we have the empirical evidence, we now had the physical evidence of the impact of these storms on our region. And in the fall, Madam Speaker, there are a series of meetings that take place. There is the, what we call UNGA, the UN General Assembly meetings. Weeks afterwards, there is the World Bank and the IMF meetings. And then in November, we have COP. And I used my position both as chairman of the OECS, as well as the chairman of the um, sustainability portfolio to now put together a strategy for us when we attended the UN. And I really want to thank, in particular, Prime Minister Gaston Brown and Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt and the countries of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Prime Minister of Grenada, for the work that they did. And basically, if you listen to the speeches that we all delivered at the UN, we repeated the same things that there needs to be, and we need to address the OECD and ODA classifications to us as countries. That we need to find funds that we can put together that we can have access to. And that we must focus our efforts on how we're going to draw down on those funds. Because that's the next problem. If you look at Haiti over the years as to how many billions of dollars was made available to Haiti to deal with their earthquake, how long has it taken for those funds to be drawn down to actually be spent to resolve the problem? And, and as solutions, and this is where the common sense comes in. So here we are prior to a hurricane, going through a very methodical process to get projects approved. But once the hurricane hits, there's no rules. If we have to do excavation, nobody's looking at any, people want to solve the problem now and our message to the world is is that we are in crisis our message to the world madam speaker is that time is our enemy we see time being our enemy in three critical ways one the opportunity costs that are lost every day because of the impact of the hurricane how much money has been lost by our farmers? How, many money, how much money has been lost by Liat? How much money is lost by all the different businesses in this region who were doing business with all those islands? How much money has been lost on those islands because they have been closed? And the sad part about the monies I'm speaking about, there is no potential for those funds to be funded, Madam Speaker. So that's why we say it's opportunity costs that are lost. The second one, Madam Speaker, which is a very harmful one, is migration. We've now seen it in all the islands, Puerto Rico, St. Martin, the Virgin Islands, and Dominica, where people feel a sense of hopelessness, people have their children to take care of, and they have to make a choice. And while Antigua and St. Lucia and many of the other islands have opened up their doors to allow those kids to come in, and all kinds of facilitations have been made, the parents themselves question why they're staying there. And Madam Speaker, there is an invisible, I call it an invisible and maybe unappreciated asset that all countries have, and that's our middle class. These are the people that are the leaders in our communities that volunteer their time, that are members of boards. And once these people leave, Madam Speaker, how do you replace them? And maybe even a more descriptive example is when you lose the rainforest in Dominica. Is there a store that you can go to and buy a rainforest that you can have it back tomorrow? So that I can go to the hardware store and fix up your roof or fix up your home or you can fix up the road, okay? It is impossible to replace a rainforest without waiting time. And the same thing applies to when you have migration. 
is only once that country begins to recover and people see hope again, and that once people have moved and may have gotten comfortable where they are, whether in fact they ever come back. The third one, Madam Speaker, is that within nine months, the next hurricane season begins. That's the reality. So there was a movie in the States called Groundhog Day, repeating the same story over and over. And that is what we find ourselves in, Madam Speaker. So when I say that time is against us, time is against us. The next one that we have, Madam Speaker, is what is the cost of resilience? So whereas we're going to borrow money very soon, $150 million US, to be able to, to upgrade our existing roads, not build any new roads, Madam Speaker, to upgrade the existing roads. Without a doubt now, we have to put all of the, of the cables and everything on the ground, which is gonna come at an extra cost. We have to build bigger drains. And what I'm saying is that we're making this capital investment, which is absolutely necessary. We have no choice but to make this capital investment. But in terms of improving the capacity of our country, it doesn't. A bridge that you have to raise its height doesn't carry any more cars than it was carrying before. Putting down wires only helps build resilience, meaning that if you have a storm, that you can get up and uh, up, up and recover it on a quicker pace. But the fact is, is you're taking monies to be able to do that. So let me put this in context now. Clearly, climate change is real. And while some countries in the world may not want to call it climate change, but may be willing to accept that there is a global warming taking place, the two produce the same results. That more than likely, we're going to see more hurricanes and we're going to see stronger hurricanes in the foreseeable future. That we have to now build resilience. Let me give you another example, Madam Speaker. We have for many years been using the schools as our shelters. We've now seen example after example where we should not do that. So in the case of a Dominica today, in which you have 80% of the homes that were damaged and people are still living in the shelter, how do you now coincide that with getting your schools back up and running? So there's a general recognition that we have to now build separate shelters for the people. So how much money are we talking about that we have to spend on this? Weekend? The problem at hand, Madam Speaker, is that when we look at the finances of our country, there is no money. Not only there's no money, Madam Speaker, the fiscal space, the amount of money that we can borrow is being restricted by the current level of debt that we have and the level of confidence that people would have in our economy if we make no changes. And the result of that, and because we are now classified as a middle income country, that when we do have to borrow money, we're having to borrow them at commercial rates. And that's our dilemma. And so it becomes now a self-defeating prophecy, Madam Speaker. That on one hand, you recognize the urgency of nine months time and the need to go and make this necessary investment and almost want to say at any cost, because how do you put a value on people's lives? Who's to say one solution's life is worth $10 million? Who's to say that? Who is going to make that judgment? And clearly, if we don't build the resilience, that is what we've done. We've put people's lives at stake, far less people's livelihoods. So Madam Speaker, after attending the UN meeting, and I really want to also thank the government of the United Kingdom, the government of the Netherlands, the French, for a very fruitful and frank meeting that we had. 
Because what was interesting at that meeting, Madam Speaker, which was all the ministers of foreign affairs for those countries, was the UK was being hampered by the same problem. The UK government was not able to send ODA funding to the BVI in Anguilla because of the same categorization, because they were perceived to be middle income and high income countries. And they recognized firsthand the absurdity of what was taking place. And Madam Speaker, that certain countries did not see that the other Caribbean islands were their first source of support. So when you look at the Dutch, and I can say this because we've had this discussion with them, I'm not being um, negatively critical, I'm just being uh, objectively critical, that they were trying to give support to the, the Dutch side of St. Martin from Curacao. Whereas Guadeloupe is 15 miles away. The rest of the islands were here to give support. And this is why in many ways, Madam Speaker, that St. Lucia offered the assistance to be able to bring prisoners to St. Lucia. Was to reinforce the point that we can be of help. That we have to be part of your plans. We indicated that we have a vested interest to see those countries back up and running again, because many of our own citizens live and benefit from those economies. So does St. Lucia have no responsibility for the St. Lucians who are in the BVI, in their safety, if there was something that we could do? But I know that the vast majority of St. Lucians understood the need to do what we did, and would understand that our government would never put the safety of St. Lucians at risk. But I say all of this, Madam Speaker, that when we went to the UN, the Secretary General of the UN, who is the former Minister of Finance and Foreign Affairs from Portugal, and who was instrumental, Madam Speaker, it, it works out, that when Jordan and Lebanon were having difficulties when the Syrian war broke out, and millions of people were migrating to those two countries, that he helped negotiate with the OECD and the ODA, that a special discompensation be made for them to allow them to borrow monies at a concessional rate, because they saw that that migration problem was not of their doing, that this was a migration of a global, global magnitude, and therefore that concession was made. And it's when we presented our case to him that he truly recognized what we were facing. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, he didn't stay in his office in New York. He traveled to Barbuda and he traveled to Dominica. And I know how grateful Prime Minister Gaston Brown and Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt were for his visit. And I would say to you, Madam Speaker, it was his visiting those countries, his influence on other international leaders around the world that produced the results that we saw at the World Bank and the IMF meeting. And I want to go on record, Madam Speaker, to truly thank the staff of the World Bank and the IMF for the work that they put into those meetings and the le high level meetings that they were orchestrated to deal specifically with this issue of climate change and the impact it was having on SID countries. And so exactly what we were hoping is that if we went to the UN, made collectively enough noise and brought to the table real solutions that that now would carry over into the World Bank and the IMF meetings. And I have to say to you that that strategy played off very, very well. In addition to meeting those entities, Madam Speaker, we had scheduled prior to the hurricanes a trip to Canada. And the purpose of the trip to Canada, Madam Speaker, was to meet with the Canadian banks with regards to correspondent banking and de-risking and their overall business in the Caribbean. Because I think that we've all seen a, a drawback by those Canadian banks of their involvement in this region. And we were accompanied by um, Prime Minister Timothy Harris. Um, we brought up the chairpersons of several of the CIP programs. And we also um, brought up the governor of the central bank. 
So because of the storms, we quickly moved to be able to get it a meeting with Justin Trudeau. And again, I want to put on record where I thank the High Commissioner in Can in, of Canadian High Commissioner based out of Barbados for assistance in facilitating that meeting. And we had a very good meeting with the Prime Minister and talked about the fact that he is on the G7. The G7 is the seven largest economies of the world. And so he has a, plays a very influential role on global policy. And that we needed for him to be the big brother. We talked about the fact that there has been a vacuum in this region of, of brotherhood. The Canadians, the British, the French, and the Americans have literally left this region to their own devices since the collapse of the Berlin Wall or the demise of the Cold War. And we asked for his support to be able to re-engage into the Caribbean. And we said that we have a huge opportunity because coming in April, Madam Speaker, there is a very large meeting to do with the Commonwealth. And we're hoping that we can come up with a new framework for the Commonwealth as we know it. And now that England is leaving Europe, clearly I think that England wants to play a more significant role. And I have to say that the reception by the Prime Minister was very heartwarming. In fact, he arranged for me to meet with his Minister of Investment, and I also met with an organization called the CCC at the same time. Madam Speaker, it would also be well documented that I had arranged to go to a state visit to Mexico. And again, the timing of that visit was fortuitous. Fortuitous in that we were able to also engage President Peña Nieto on being a big brother. Because Mexico is part of the G20, 20 of the largest economies in the world. So one of the largest economies in our hemisphere. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, they existed before a policy that was called the three borders, which was Canada, CARICOM, and Mexico, in which the United States had policies to support the economic development of those countries in recognizing that in doing so that you would strengthen the borders of America. But again, with NAFTA, the demise of the Cold War, that seemed to have fallen on deaf ears, and many of the benefits that we had been receiving, we lost. So in part, what we did was had a meeting with Canada and also with Mexico to encourage them to reconsider having a Caribbean, Mexico, Canadian summit. So I'm very happy to say to you, Madam Speaker, at the CARICOM Mexico summit that we had in Belize, that President Peña Nieto um, has agreed to put that forward. I know that we have gotten a verbal commitment from the Canadians. And I know that my colleague prime ministers in the CARICOM were very happy to hear that this is the direction we're going in. But as a first step, we're going to have a meeting with the governors of the central banks of Canada, Mexico, and CARICOM, hopefully as early as January, to meet to, tell them, to figure out how we can try to resolve this corresponding bank and de-risking situation. I say this all to say, Madam Speaker, that again, all of this came about because there was an opportunity where the world's attention was on the Caribbean. And again, in addition to the empirical evidence, we now had the factual evidence of the impact of what these hurricanes were on us. And the inability of our countries to be able to move forward without changing their thinking. So we have two meetings that are left for the rest of the year, Madam Speaker, that are very critical. One is we have the COP meeting which is taking place in Bonn. Um, there are several proposals that are being put on the table. One of them, Madam Speaker, is that we're participating in the development of what's called a white paper, a discussion paper, to look at the possibility of creating what we call a resilience bond. Because we don't believe that there's enough money available in the public sector to solve the Caribbean's longer term problems. That we believe that we have to find a way to be able to attract private sector funds into it. There are trillions of dollars that are in either negative bonds around the world or in non-yielding deposits. So the question becomes, what are the, what's the framework that you have to create in order to allow the private sector to want to put their monies into the bonds in hopes that their monies will be secure and could produce a positive return? And that is the challenge that we've given to the authors of this uh, white paper. 
We're then going, um, as I said, to follow up with Canada, Mexico, and Chile. And I'm also happy to report, Madam Speaker, that the Secretary General of the UN has commissioned a major donor conference in New York on November 22nd. And the, the purpose of this conference is to bring together world leaders, international organizations, on how we can get funds available now. So we talked about getting the monies available and also to discuss the mechanism on how we're going to draw down on these funds. What's going to be the conditionality to be able to draw on these funds? Because there's no point telling us the money is there. The leader of the opposition and I were joking because I said the CDB is the, the most politically correct organization in the Caribbean. Because one, one government starts the project and another government comes in and gets to either uh, finish it. So it takes too long. And we've got to be able to resolve that. And we've got to recognize that time is against us if we have the will to be able to resolve that problem. So Madam Speaker, the last one I want to say that in addition to Canada and Mexico is that we also had a state visit by the President of Chile. And in a recent meeting that the Minister of Foreign Affairs attended with the Lima Group, that we saw that Mexico, Canada, and Chile were able to very aptly uh, um, present our case to some of the larger countries that were there and to understand more of what's taking place in the Caribbean. And what we're trying to stop is this level of criticism that sometimes is laid upon us in terms of why we make certain decisions. And the fact is, is that we as a region have had to make decisions based on survival. And that sometimes some of the more loftier goals have to be set aside because you can't get funds elsewhere. And so I'm never going to be critical of any of my colleagues for some of the decisions they may make that I may either support or don't support because I understand the predicament that they're all in. So I want to report that to um, uh, Parliament, Madam Speaker, and to say that we're going to continue to be able to fight very hard to bring a practical solution in real time um, to the island of St. Lucia and hopefully to the wider Caribbean. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just before I recognize the mic of the Honorable Minister for Agriculture, but just before that, I wish to inform honorable members that I'm in receipt of um, information that the Honorable Bradley Felix, member for Swazel Saltibus is unable to be here with us today because he's out of state on government business. Honorable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to say good morning to Parliament and my parliamentary colleagues. Madam Speaker, please permit me to make a statement which of course will be circulated in this honorable house on the status of the banana industry in St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, it's unfortunate that um, my good friend from the Fort North is not here today to hear of the accomplishments that we have made over the past few months as it pertains to this industry but I'm sure he will get a copy of the statement, and at some point in time, he will give his own inputs as to how we can improve the program and the policies that we are articulating. Although I heard in recent times, Madam Speaker, he said he's wearing three hats, but it's not agriculture, it's health. So now he has moved from agriculture to health, but I'm sure he would, at some point in time, give some input as to agriculture. Madam Speaker, Despite the many challenges facing the banana industry, the government of St. Lucia, and by extension, the Ministry of Agriculture, considers that the banana industry is a critical and important component in our agricultural development for us. But the ministry believes that this commodity can continue to play a vital role in the economic development of our country, generate employment, and ensure food security for thousands of households who reside in our rural communities. 
Madam Speaker, in 2017-2018, the Prime Minister, during his budget address, made mention of a banner productivity improvement project and approved finances to, to the, for the implementation of that project. That project seeks to, Madam Speaker, help in the short term to restore and improve the quality of livelihoods of our rural folks, to bring stability in the banana industry and ensure that is viable in the short to medium term. That project, Madam Speaker, is geared to return confidence in the banana industry and confidence of our farmers to get involved in banana production. And of course, our target, Madam Speaker, over the next three years, three to four years, is to in increase the acreage from 1,400 to 2,400 acres. Of course, by accomplishing all the above, Madam Speaker, we are expected to see a decline in productivity and an improvement of production from its current levels. Madam Speaker, one of the objectives, again, of the project is to establish a financial mechanism where farmers can get finances to be able to undertake the rehabilitation of their fields. And of course, you heard the Prime Minister spoke about the impact of climate change. And of one of the objectives is to see how we can develop the agriculture and specifically the banana industry to a level where it can be resilient to climate change. Madam Speaker, this project envisages an industry that is streamlined to meet the many requirements that provide opportunities as far as market is concerned. We know of opportunities in the UK. And I want to report here, Madam Speaker, since we came back, the Prime Minister and myself have met with a number of organizations in the UK who have confirmed to us that they're interested in Windward Island bananas. We have opened up market opportunities in France, Madam Speaker, and not Matnik. I want to make a clarification. We're not speaking of Matnik. We say that we are going to the French market and we're referring to France. And of course, the domestic market provides opportunities. Madam Speaker, Another area of opportunities for us as it pertains to the banana industry is the regional markets and the cruise ship industry. We believe that if we can produce consistency in supplies, we can tap in the, into the cruise ship industry. So what, are we, what have we put in place, Madam Speaker, to enable us to be able to capitalize on these respective markets? One, we are going to give support for farmers to establish new fields and to expand the fields. We're going to provide support in land development, fertilizer, pest and disease control. We're going to provide support, Madam Speaker, in drainage works and land development for the establishment of new fields. And of course, reduce the price of fertilizer by 50%. So, Madam Speaker, Sanuka Ife. Nous avons un support pour les farmers pour qu'ils puissent plus de figues. Nous avons un support pour qu'ils cultiver plus de figues. Nous avons un support en sel, guano. Nous avons un support en chimique pour les spots. Nous avons un support pour le canal et puis qu'ils puissent planter des fils qui naissent. And for support in drainage, we are looking at 300 acres, $300 an acre. And for land development for new fields, $500 per acre. <laughs> Madam Speaker, lease spot control is also important. And as a ministry, 
we're going to give support to our farmers at 50% of the cost as it pertains to the control of black cigatoka and yellow cigatoka. I want to say, Madam Speaker, that we have transformed the black cigatoka unit. We have transformed it to be a technical unit with the capacity to support our farmers and enable our farmers to have proper lease spot control. Work will continue with CIRAD and the Taiwanese Technical Mission. And I say continue, Madam Speaker, because when we came in, we found that they were work that are started before our time. And I want to recognize the effort of the previous government as it pertains to this. We will continue in assisting farmers with black cigatoka and demonstrating resistant varieties as it pertains to managing the black cigatoka program. Madam Speaker, One of the greatest challenges that we face in this industry is the reliable supply of inputs. And I refer to inputs, I refer to fertilizer, oil, and chemicals to help the farmers with the post-harvesting activities. Like I said earlier, we shall provide funding where farmers will be able to get the resources so that they can procure on a timely basis the inputs that are required so at least we can accomplish the objective of increasing, increasing productivity and production. Madam Speaker, the project will cost 16.5 $16.166 million. Of that total, Madam Speaker, the government of Taiwan will provide $7.5 million. And the government of St. Lucia will provide the balance. And I want to express our appreciation to the Minister of Finance and my cabinet for the support as it pertains to this. Madam Speaker, over the, year, over the past few months, we have seen that we have rehabilitated new fields, 113 acres of new planting since April 2017. We have seen a number of young persons getting involved in the industry, and you're providing support to these young persons, especially in the Mabuya Valley. We have opened up drains in Tomazo, Miku, Mabuya Valley, and Cronlands, and that has impacted positively on our banana farmers. Madam Speaker, I remember saying that we had the opportunity to, to sell in the French market, and initially we were looking at selling, started commencing a trial in January of 2017. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, because of the passage of Tropical Storm Matthew, we could not have started the trial. I want to report in this honorable house today, Madam Speaker, that we are going to start the trial in December 2017. Whilst, whilst we, had a, we had agreed with a French company in, in France that we have started in January of 2018. But Madam Speaker, because of the production level that we are experiencing right now, and because of the impact of the program that we established and implemented for our farmers, I can report here in this honorable house, Madam Speaker, that we are commencing the shipment to France much earlier than we anticipated. And that is an accomplishment, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I want to thank the government of Taiwan. I want to thank my cabinet ministers, my peers, and the, and the staff of the Ministry of Agriculture for the support. And I'm looking forward to making more pronouncements in this honorable house. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Papers to be laid. Honorable Prime Minister and Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following papers standing in my name. 
Statutory Instrument Number 93A of 2017, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule 1, Number 6 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 94 of 2017, Finance Administration <coughs> Act, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow for Capital Expenditure, Youth Empowerment Project. Statutory Instrument Number 95 of 2017, Invest St. Lucia, Derrier Morn View Fort Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 96 of 2017, Investment Invest St. Lucia, Palm Auger View Fort Vesting Order. Statutory Instrument Number 101 of 2017, Excise Tax Amendment of Schedule Number One. Number, sorry, Schedule 1, Number 7, Order. Citizenship by Investment Unit, SIU, report on the financial statements for the year ended March 31st, 2017. And CIP St. Lucia, Annual Report 2016-2017. Honorable Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources, Incorporated. Madam Speaker, I would like to present to this Honorable House the following people standing in my name. Statutory Instrument Number 90 of 2017, Fisheries Amendment Regulation. Honorable Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth Development, Culture, and Local Government. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I would like on behalf of the Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for commerce, industry, enterprise, enterprise development, and consumer affairs to lay the following papers. Statutory Instrument Number 93 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 14 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 97 of 2017, Fiscal Incentives Rambali Blocks Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 98 of 2017, Fiscal Incentives Nationwide Concrete Suppliers Limited Order. Statutory Instrument Number 99 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 15 Order. Statutory Instrument Number 100 of 2017, Price Control Amendment Number 16, Order. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, um, I would like to also lay the following um, statutory instruments that should be in my name. Um, the statutory instrument number 91 of 2017 tourism duty-free shopping system cox building order and also the statutory instrument number 92 of 2017 tourist duty-free shopping system block and parcel number 00316482 order Motions. Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following motions standing in my name. Whereas it is provided by Section 39.1 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 15.01, that the Minister responsible for finance may by resolution of Parliament, borrow money from a bank or other financial institution for the capital expenditure of government. And whereas it is further provided by Section 42.1 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that there shall be charged upon and paid out of the consolidated fund debt charges for which the government is liable. And whereas the Minister responsible for finance considers, considers it necessary to borrow EC $15 million by the way of credit in the resolution referred to as the credit from First National Bank St. Lucia Limited for capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. 
and whereas interest on the principal amount of the credit is repayable at a rate of 6% per annum due one month after the full drawdown, and whereas the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $126,579 per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. Be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow EC $15 million by way of credit in this resolution referred to as the credit from First National Bank St. Lucia Limited for a capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. Be it further resolved that interest on the principal amount of the credit is payable at a rate of 6% per annum due one month after the full down drawdown and the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $126,579 per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. So Madam Speaker, the next two motions really are tied together. So I'm going to give explanatory notes and expand my, or sorry, explain the, uh, the motion. So first of all, Madam Speaker, the Parliament by resolution authorized the Minister of Finance to raise the sum of EC $365 million under the National Savings and Development, Bonds, De De Development Bond Act by the issue of saving bonds for the financing of the 2017-2018 budget and for debt refinancing as follows. EC $103 million for financing capital expenditure in the 2017-2018 estimate expenditure. EC $262 million for the rolling over of existing debt. So it means that bonds and treasury bills that we had, that we would roll those over. I now seek by resolution, Madam Speaker, parliamentary approval to authorize the Minister of Finance to borrow EC $40 million, which is the $15 million in this motion and the $25 million coming in the next motion, but obviously we have to approve them separately, and I understand that. So this is only for explanatory purposes. That we're going to borrow EC $40 million in loans from the two indigenous banks of St. Lucia, the Bank of St. Lucia Limited, and also the First National Bank of St. Lucia Limited. Given that these two are a loan financing authority, it's sought pursuant to Section 39 of the Finance Administration Act, which governs borrowing by means of loans. Madam Speaker, the Department of Finance invited proposals from the Bank of St. Lucia and the First National Bank to borrow EC $25 million and $15 million respectively for 15-year loans under the following terms and conditions. Under the First National Bank, it's $15 million, an interest rate of 6%. That the interest and principal is $1,518,948 per year. And the arrangement fee is 0.5%. And the tenure is 15 years. And the repayment structure is amortized. These resolutions before Parliament is seek to approve the government to solution to raise the sum of $40 million through demand loans from the Bank of St. Lucia and First National Bank. The proposals submitted by the Bank of St. Lucia and the First National Bank Limited are attractive options, particularly when viewed in context of current market conditions and in rising interest rates on the international financial market. As part of the preparation for assessing funding for the regional market, a preliminary market analysis had indicated that interest rates on Government of St. Lucia 15-year security will be in the vicinity of 7.95%. The interest rate offered by the banks is 6%, is more attractive than rates on the regional bond market with corresponding maturities. Furthermore, a bond-specific credit rating is required when assessing funds through the regional market, and this tends to yield a higher transaction cost. In addition, when compared to other multilateral creditors like the Caribbean Development Bank, the bank's terms and conditions are concessionary. Additionally, the bank's proposal gave the government an alternative avenue to source these funds. From a cash flow perspective, Madam Speaker, this is important, the monthly repayment profile is in keeping with the debt strategy of 
amortizing a greater proportion of our debt stock. Currently, 57% of our debt is structured as bullet payments. Let me explain that, Madam Speaker. That we've long gone back and forth and had discussions about the necessity of a sinking fund. So what in not having a sinking fund means that when the debt comes to its end and all you've been doing is paying the interest of the, of the loan, you still have to pay the principal. So the bullet payment is when you allow yourself to borrow money under those terms and you don't either have the discipline to have a sinking fund or to do it in a manner in which we're paying included on a monthly basis the payments to repay the principal. So what happens is that when you have that bullet payment, more than likely what governments have done is to just turn over the debt. So it means that you're continuing to pay the interest on that same amount that you've borrowed, but you've done nothing to be able to reduce your overall debt. So in built into this payments, Madam Speaker, it's very important to note that we also have the principal payments that are built into it. In the absence of a sinking fund, this structure increases the rollover risk and places added pressure on the cash flow. So if you don't pay the principal on a monthly basis and you have to make a bullet payment, it has a more severe impact on your cash flow. And particularly since that the former government discarded the need for a, a sinking fund, it means that now you have to extract money from your cash flow to make this big payment or what they have normally done is just turned over the debt. So it means the cost of borrowing that money in the first place actually becomes much more expensive. So Madam Speaker, for the reasons stated above, these resolutions present opportunities for assessing credit at more cost-effective terms and hence reduces the requirement to be borrowed under the National Savings and Development Bond Act for the 2017-18 estimates. So Madam Speaker, I submit the resolutions for the consideration of this House. And just add the fact, Madam Speaker, that we have achieved a couple of things here. One, that we're getting a 6% interest rate, that the period for repayments is 15 years. So right now, if we are to get a competitive rate out in the market, we would have to get Treasury bills, which would be for a much shorter period of time. And in fact, that, that is our problem right now, Madam Speaker, is that a lot of our debt is being rolled over too frequently. We've gone from rolling over our debt on average every 10 years to now just at four years. So just this year alone, we've had to roll over almost a billion dollars in debt. So Madam Speaker, I put this to the House for uh, your support. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the minister responsible for finance to borrow EC $15 million by way of credit in this resolution referred to as the credit from First National Bank St. Lucia Limited for capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. And that A, interest on the principal amount of the credit is repayable at the rate of 6% per annum due one month after the full drawdown and B, the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $126,579 per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Member for Castries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just want to Based on the record, the fact that we were called to this meeting for the four days' notice, and the, the volume of, of stuff on the other paper, including borrowing of nearly $45 million necessitated the fact that we needed some time to discuss and talk about it, but notwithstanding the fact that we were not offered the normal time, which is usually seven days,
to be able to have a look at the other people. We thought it's important that we be here this morning to debate what is not really a simple matter. Madam Speaker, you may recall in the meeting of Parliament of the 27th of June, on the other paper was a, was a resolution by the Minister of Finance, and the, re, the resolution read as follows. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance, I can make a document at the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Be it resolved that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to raise a sum of 103 million for financing of the 2017-2018 budget and a sum of 262 million for refinancing the existing debts on the regional government security market or through private placements at a maximum rate of 7.5%. At that time, Madam Speaker, in my contribution, I made the point that that could not be enough money to conduct the finance of the country. And as usual, I was attacked by the Prime Minister and his surrogates in and out of the House because I said that was not enough. All the Prime Minister had to say is, if you we, if we want some more, we'll come back by resolution. But no. There was the usual, Madam Speaker, attack, 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 attack. You all made a mess of the economy. You did this, you did that. Well, Madam Speaker, I just want to read from, for you from the Economic and Social Review, page 50, financing. And it reads, financing pressure eased in 2016-2017 as investors' appetite for government debt instruments showed signs of improvement. This resulted in government raising $139.9 million in bond financing, $43.2 million above the approved amounts. That was in 2016. Well, Madam Speaker, you hear it's because the government changed. Confidence has returned, and the bonds are selling because of confidence, Madam Speaker. But this is a social and... and and economic review. I want to go further, Madam Speaker, and read from page 56, monetary and financial sector. The 2016 monetary accounts of St. Lucia present a mixed picture with the stock of outstanding domestic credit falling for the third consecutive year. While both monetary liabilities and net foreign assets continue to increase relative to balances in 2015. The growth in net foreign assets were particularly large, growing by 67.5%, 181.1 million to 449.5 million. The growth, both in magnitude and direction, reflects a continuation of development in 2015, where in that year, Net foreign assets moved from a liability position of 305.2 million to an asset position of 268.4 million. The reversal in 2015 marked the first asset position since 2007. Data for 2016 show that the positive growth, which is underpinned by commercial bank activity, has continued from the trend established in 2015. So, Madam Speaker, that was, not, that was prepared when we were out of government. So when you, you hear that this, the, the, the Labour Party left the economy in a mess, as soon as we returned, confidence is back, business is flourishing, bonds are selling because the United Workers' Party is in power. That really, Madam Speaker, it does not, the facts do not say that. But having said so, we always made the point that the economy of St. Lucia is, it has some issues, that the economy needs restructuring, that the debt profile is too high. We always made that point. That was never a point we hid. We always made that point. But, Madam Speaker, at the time, and I've said in this house, 
that you cannot talk economics away. Economics are, is based on figures, figures. You can't talk it away. And at some point, all the talk and the bravado will come down to basic figures, dollars and cents figures. And Madam Speaker, history will prove me right. When the Prime Minister read his budget, I made the point also that the, that the budget was reckless. It was reckless because the recurrent deficit was increasing by 109% to 7.6% from the previous position of 3.4%, and that was not the correct trajectory. I also said that the primary deficit was coming from a surplus of 50.7% to a negative of $102 million, Madam Speaker. I also said that the overall deficit was increasing to 4.7% from a position of 1.4% in the previous year. And that was not the correct trajectory for the economy. But as usual, Madam Speaker, instead of the government this understanding that something structurally is wrong, and let us find a way to solve it, the attack, economic terrorists, all sorts of things, Madam Speaker, because I have stated facts, not words, facts, Madam Speaker. So we are here this morning to borrow, in effect, $40 million from local banks. And you may recall that I said that the $103 million for financing the budget could not be enough. All the Prime Minister had to say was, let us start with that, and we'll come by resolution if we need some more. No, he attacked. He attacked. Let me give you, Madam Speaker, the facts as it relates to borrowing from this, by this government since it got into power. On the 27th of June, they borrowed $11.2 million U.S. dollars of 40 million EC dollars for the January water supply. On that same day, they borrowed 15 million US dollars for the tourism competitiveness pro project. To, they borrowed, today, we're going to borrow 1.62 million for the DVRP. And last time we were here, we borrowed 2.8 million US for the youth empowerment project. In total, this government has borrowed $86.6 .6 million EC. And today, we are borrowing 40 million EC, equivalent to $122.6 million. But you may recall that in the, in the resolution, Madam Speaker, what the, re the resolution spoke to is $103 million for financing the 2017-2018 budget. But to date, we have borrowed $122.6 million. Is the Prime Minister breaking the law? Is the Prime Minister breaking the law, Madam Speaker? What is happening is the confidence which the budget needs to give the public. $103 million for financing the 2017 20 budget. That is what the, the motion says on the 27th of June. And to date, fact, the fact is we have borrowed $122.6 million. Whether the borrowing is justified, of course, you need to borrow for the denry water supply. You need to borrow for tourism. Of course, you need to. But, Madam Speaker, what my point of departure is the attacking and the trying to talk, trying to influence people when the facts are clear. Fact is, Madam Speaker, we have borrowed $122 million. Whether it's necessary, it may be, but we borrowed it. So when I made that point, Madam Speaker, and I was attacked and ridiculed, tried to be to, to, to ridiculed by people who think they, they know better, surrogates in and side of this house, Madam Speaker, the facts speak to themselves, for themselves, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, I'm going to go a little further into the very heart of this government. How the government doesn't stick to reality. 
And I heard, I heard the Prime Minister this morning. He had some, he, he delved into some sort of reality. The reality of the situation that we face in this country. Not the talk and the attacking and the, and the, and the vindictiveness and the make them cry. And the CDP project not going to, to members of the opposition, Madam Speaker. This, the, the government, the members on this side, we have not been told how one cent of the, of the Taiwanese CDP project will be spent in our constituencies. But these things are happening in my constituency, Madam Speaker. In all of our constituencies, CDP projects have happened and they will happen, Madam Speaker, because the government's official policy is to make them cry. That's official policy, make them cry. So what they do is that these projects will continue in our constituencies and hoping that they will get political advantage. So, Madam Speaker, we get back to the Prime Minister's budget speech. And I go to page 44 of the, of the budget speech, and that already is a document of the House. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister speaks to financing of the budget. And he says, and I quote, page 44, other loans, other loans totaling 84.8 million, comprising 43.1 million from the Caribbean Development Bank, 24.9 million from the World Bank, 13.6 million from the Republic of China, Taiwan, 1 million from the National Insurance Corporation, and 2.2 million from the Kuwaiti Fund for Arab Economic Development. 84.4 million, Madam Speaker, making a total of $342 million. That's how the budget will be financed. And out of that, Madam Speaker, $362 million would be for capital. But, Madam Speaker, nowhere in this document, and I'm not calling into any question the ability of, of the local banks, but nowhere in this document was ever any conversation of borrowing from the local banks. I just want to make that point, Madam Speaker. I just want to make that point. Nowhere in this budget that it was ever said that loans will have come from the local banks. And you can, we, can, we can pursue it, and you can find out, Madam Speaker. But that, that is how the Prime Minister said that he would finance his budget, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, I want to ask the Prime Minister a few questions. The United Nations Party has been in government from June last year. I want to find out, Madam Speaker, what is the real state of the economy? Not statements about confidence, facts, figures. I want to find out what is the recurrent deficit. I want to find out, Madam Speaker, what are the growth projections? What has been the growth profile for this year? Figures, not gut feeling, not what you think. What has been the growth trajectory for this country for the last six months? The budget was in April. We have another budget coming up in April, Madam Speaker. I want to find out, Madam Speaker, what are the revenue projections? How much money have we collected from VAT? What has been the impact of the reduction in VAT on the revenue of the country? What has been the impact of the reduction of VAT on the cash flow of the country? Figures, figures, not bland statements of hope or bland statements for the press. Figures, Madam Speaker, what has been the impact of the reduction of VAT? I want to find, Madam Speaker, how much money has the fuel tax collected? And where is the lockbox account? In which lock and in which box? Where is the lockbox account for the fuel that the government increased by 60%, the tax on fuel? And they made a big story of it when I said so. A big story. 60%, Madam Speaker. And they said it would go in a lockbox. In fact, government ministers were all over the world saying, we'll borrow because we have a lockbox. All the money for fuel will go in the lockbox. And we'll fix all the roads in the country. All. Oh, how much is in the lockbox? How much money is in that lockbox account since you changed the excise tax for fuel? How much is in the lockbox account? I want to find out, Madam Speaker, that you have CIP projections of revenue of $43 million. But 
A document in this house on the CIP report says that up to March 2017, only $5 million of revenue had been collected from the CIP, up to March 2017 for the year. But in your revenue projections, and again, Madam Speaker, that can be a document in the house, is the estimates, is the estimates of expenditure, the estimates, is the estimates of, of expenditure, you will see, Madam Speaker, that the estimates of expenditure see in financing the, the budget on page 509, CIP revenue, $43 million. I don't need to make a document house because you're a document house, $43 million. But up to March, you've collected $5 million. What are the, the CIP projections for revenue? How are you financing the, 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 government, the government expenditure if all these revenue sources have gone down? You promise to increase the fuel tax by $150, $1.50, but you put a cap on fuel. So your revenue projections must be less. How will that impact the overall revenue of the country? I'm not asking for a tax. I'm asking for facts, figures. How, how will, if you project $43 million in CIP revenue, you've only collected $4 million up to March, the year we are in October, you have a few more months, how much revenue do you project to come from the CIP and how will that impact on the financing of, of your country, Madam Speaker? I want to ask, how much is in the sinking fund? The Prime Minister is very fond of attacking me on the sinking fund. I still have my position on, on the sinking fund. How much, rev how much money do you have in the sinking fund? How much have you put aside in the sinking fund to do all the noble things you, you spoke about. Facts, not fake news, not attacks. Facts, figures, how many dollars? Two million, three million, four million. How much money do you have in the sinking fund, Madam Speaker? I want to find out what are the growth projections for the economy? What, what growth are you predicting? 2%, 3%, 4%? We, we said that we wanted, we wanted the United, United Party manifesto said they were projecting growth of 15% for the next three years. What, how you've set these targets? How have you reached there? What, what, is, what, what are the growth figures? Figures, facts, percentages. You, have, you, can, you can find that out, Madam Speaker. I want to find out, Madam Speaker, what, what are the government's economic policies that will create the growth? Ojo Labs? The only investment that this government has worked on fervently is Ojo Labs. And you know the cost of OJ Labs, $4 million to refit, to refit the, the, the building and paying the salaries. All the other government investments, they have not come to bear. They, it's just talk. But I know what you stopped. I know you stopped a, a, a building in Vuvot. I know you stopped the highway in, 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 in Grosley. I know you stopped that. I know you stopped the PUP on the airport. And the airport is a, a big story. The airport. That airport is something by, when the story starts on the airport, it's going to be a big story, the airport. I know you stopped it. I know you stopped the, the IFC from doing a PEP for the airport. And when the debate comes on the airport, and make the point, Madam Speaker, on why you stopped it. But the point I'm making, what the government projections are talk. You lend range passport money at 2%, and you say they, they, they'll build a hotel. Not one blockers. Not one block on the ground yet. Not one block. Not one block. I hope it comes. I really hope it comes, you know. Because I don't. I heard somebody on the radio the other day saying the opposition is happy when there's crime. I mean, you, you, you think somebody can say that? You think a young person can go in public and say the opposition is happy when there's crime? Why would an opposition be happy when there's crime? This is our country. We intend to run it at some point. Why would it be happy when there's crime? Why? But, but, Madam Speaker, when you're in opposition, your words are used to hunt you. You will, you will recall very well who said St. Lucia will be made safe. We all know who said it. But that, that, that's not our position. Why would I want St. Lucia to have crime? Why? Why won't I want a hotel to be built in St. Lucia? Because, Madam Speaker, and that must go to what the government is doing. When you victimize people, when you stop people from getting work, because you perceive them to be supporters of the Labour Party. You know what you're doing? You're not only victimizing the person themselves, you know. 
because they employ people. And the people they employ may be UDIP supporters. In one house, you have UDIP supporter, Leopard supporter. In one house, you have different people. So when you victimize somebody, when you say over your dead body, these people get work in the country. When you say that, you know what you're doing? You're not only affecting the person, you're affecting the people that will be employed. So when you starve Cassius East of, of CDP projects, and you starve it, and you believe that Philip J. Pierre will lose his seat, a dream. When you start doing these things, what you do is you affect other people in the constituents, not me, other people who may be your supporters. So this victimization, this vindictive kick of the government, they must stop, settle on, settle. So, Madam Speaker, what are the projects that the government has taken to cause any significant growth in the country, Madam Speaker? Tomorrow, Digicel is opening its head office. Very good. No, no, but, but it came at a cost. It came at a cost, Madam Speaker. It came at a cost. We had to forego endless taxes, forego endless revenue. Of course, it will create employment. We, the idea of having offices, head offices, is not a novel idea. It started under us. We did the IBC Act to cause companies to incorporate in St. Lucia. Nothing novel. That, that didn't come from, from, from any high science. But these things come at a cost. The country loses revenue. So you have to weigh the cost as against the benefits. So, that, so this was only two projects that this government can boast of. One, Ojo Labs at a great cost, and two, the digital opening tomorrow. Two projects. All the rest, talk. What was there, you stopped. You can imagine how your government would have benefited if you didn't allow, you didn't allow that pettiness, that vindictive streak, that streak made them cry. If you didn't allow that, that, that streak in, in your government, you can imagine where you'd, you, you'd be today. You stopped all the projects. You stopped everything that would cause St. Lucia to move. You stopped it. And, you, and now, right now, Mr. Speaker, you have to pay for it. You're paying for it. You know how you pay for it? You pay for it by, by be, being able to just dream of projects that will come on stream. They will. They will. You pay for it by having to give generous, generous tax concessions. You pay for it by having to sometimes pay people's salaries. You pay the salaries for Ojo Labs. That's how you pay for it to create employment. Because you stop projects that could have moved the country forward. And you would benefit. You would benefit. But you stopped it. Vindictiveness. Make them cry. That's the price you pay for that kind of thing, Madam Speaker. And time. I said here in this honorable house, there's one thing the government can't stop is time. We are in October. We are in November 2017. Time. One thing you can't stop. So when you go along with that vindictive streak, that streak of make them cry, you pay for it. And you see, nothing's happening. There was a survey in the country. Go to the streets and ask the man in the streets, how is the economy doing? You know what he'll tell you? Boss man, nothing is running. Nothing is running, boss man. Nothing is running. That's what they'll tell you. Because it's all in your mind. Only in your mind you think things are running. Because you believe, you believe that when the time comes, you'll do what you have to do. But, Madam Speaker, I want, to, I want to get back to the point, Madam Speaker, that this government, and in that boring profile, Nothing about fresh start yet and $15 million. In this other paper, there was, in an other paper, in this house, the previous other paper, $15 million by DFC for fresh start. That is not yet in the debt profile. It's not there yet. You have to come back there. So that's 122 plus 15. That's 137. Are you, I'm just asking a question. Are you going to pay fresh start? from the $40 million that is borrowing today? Are you going to pay fresh start for the roads in Miku from the $40 million that you're borrowing today? Because the DFC, the motion that you had for fresh start, it has just disappeared from the other paper. Where are you going to pay fresh start from? You, you need the roads, Mr. Prime Minister. Of course you need, you need the roads. But you had a motion of $15 million there from fresh start, it's disappeared. I'd like to find out how are you going to pay for that? I know some time ago, 
A member of your, of your cabinet said, the fresh start is so nice that the whole set of working for us and you have paid them nothing yet. Such a great company. They did all the roads in forest and you haven't paid them. Fresh start, yes. Have you paid them? Is the, is the money you're borrowing today to pay fresh start for the forest roads? Forest that, the, the forest housing scheme. Oh, housing scheme, yeah. You remember you said that some, one of your surrogates said that fresh start is such a great company that they did all the work at forest here, in the forest house, and you haven't paid them one cent. And anybody who could have done the work cheaper, come to him and he, and he would employ them. My, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, that's the kind of government you, 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 you preside over, you know. A minister going in public, saying to people, come to me and I'll employ you. For a contract with minister, you, the whole tender thing has gone out of the window. Mr. Prime Minister, that's, that's public knowledge, you know. That's what the minister said, it's public. If you can find somebody who can do, do the job cheaper, come to me. That's him. But Mr. Prime Minister, you must call a halt to that. You must call a halt to that. You must call a halt to that. So I want to find out how are we paying fresh that? Is the fifteen million dollars coming back? Have you paid for the, 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 the roadworks in Forestier? Have you paid for it? The housing in Forestier, the housing on the, in the roadworks in the housing scheme in Forestier. Have you paid for it? How are you paying that? Where is that in the debt profile? Further, the airport, the and mines, we're speaking of, of borrowing. I know, and the government hasn't denied it, that the government has canceled the PPP for the airport. They've canceled it. The, the government hasn't said that's not true. But in terms of revenue, we're going to be coming for airport development tax, but that's for another show. I know that the cost of the airport is about 150 million US dollars. So you're going to include that on the debt profile again. Questions? I want to, I, I'll wait for the answer. I'll wait for the answer. So, Madam Speaker, reality has hit this government. This government must come to grips with the real situation and stop believing they can talk and they can victimize the problems of the country away. They cannot. I have made this point here many times. The opposition will never go away. We will never go away. Never. When I leave, somebody else will come. This, this Labour Party is the oldest party in St. Lucia. We will never die. So it's no use you believe that you can run us away, or you can victimize us away, or you can be vindictive and, and get us. You can't. So what you have to do is you have to look at the problems in this country. Look at it in a way that will put you in a favorable way in the history of, of, of St. Lucia. Don't look at it in the eyes of people who are only interested in making people cry. Don't, don't put it in the eyes of people who every time they open their mouth is victimize them. Get Kenny, get Pierre. Don't look, at, don't look at it that way. Look at it in a way that will benefit the children of St. Lucia. Do not look at it in a way where you will increase the burden on the children of St. Lucia because you want to get at Kenny. Don't look at it as that way. Leave Kenny alone. Kenny's gone. Look at the country. He's gone. He's not Prime Minister again. He's not Minister of Finance. Look at the country. You see, it's them tricks you're trying. Them things, them things that go work. You've been trying these things all your life. You see, you've all been trying these things all your life. These things are working. This party is more united than, is more united than it ever was before. Don't try them tricks. That, that, that's not working. That's not working. And, and let me advise you. I won my nomination by more votes than you. There were 70 against you, there was only 60 against me. So I won burden you. That was, I won burden, I did burden you. <laughs> so don't try that, you understand? So man, so, yeah, but I did burden you. I did burden you. Inside there, they have at least two people who, who run against you. Yeah, and, and they won. So don't try this thing, don't try that. There are, there are at least two people that will run against you. And in that running, one of them, one of them had the worst thing to say about you. One of them had the worst thing about you in that running process. So don't try that. You see, when you're going down that track, you're going to get lost. That's not your business. And, and especially the fact, you had fellas around, you, 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 you know what. So don't, don't try that. So, <coughs> 
Madam Speaker. <laughs> he was a campaign manager. <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, five times, me five. So, Madam Speaker, this government is leading the country down a dangerous track. This government is not facing reality. This government is living in a world of dreams, a world of make-belief. This government is living, hoping and praying that somebody will come from somewhere with a magic wand and create employment, 5,000 people, hoping that some big investor will just land. That will not happen. This government has to bring the confidence, has to take the people of St. Lucia in their confidence. This government has to look at different models to develop this country. The idea of tax and spend, the idea of giving the country away with incentives, hoping that something will happen. The idea of jobs at all costs, Madam Speaker, this government must rethink its position. This government must look towards small and medium-sized enterprises. This government must look to the resilience of the people of St. Lucia. Do not divide the people. Do not victimize business people who you perceive are not supporting you. Do not use incentives as a weapon. Don't use it. Look at the country as a whole. Because if you do not do that, you'll have to come back here again and again to borrow, borrow, borrow. And you know why you can borrow? The reason why you can borrow is simply because, simply because, man, speak, and I want to refer to a document to the Social and Economic Review. Public debt. You see, they hide all these things. They give the impression that since they came into power, everything is good. Debt has reduced. Confidence has returned. Public debt. Page 51. At the end of 2016, at the end of 2016, six months into the rule, six months, eh? The official stock of public debt, which includes central government liabilities, government guaranteed and public non guaranteed debt, grew by 2.6% to, to 2.9 million. This represents a slowdown in the rate of debt accumulation which in the last decade has grown at an average of 6.8%. Consequently, the debt to GDP ratio increased to 66.4% in 2016 from 65.4% in 2015. So if they continue on this trajectory, if they continue, Madam Speaker, because you must understand, they have to come back here and borrow 15 million for fresh start. They have to borrow 150 million for the airport. The Prime Minister said today he has to borrow 150 million to fix roads. The Prime Minister hasn't told us, so that's 200 million plus 15 million. He has to borrow 215 million. That will take the debt profile back up to the 90s, where it's not supposed to be. So, Madam Speaker, I urge this government to let good sense prevail. I urge this government to understand that this country doesn't belong to them. It doesn't belong to UWPs. It doesn't belong to their party people. It belongs to the people of St. Lucia. And stop the pettiness. Stop the vindictiveness. Stop it. Because it, it makes, you may, you may believe that because today you are in power, you can make people cry and make people suffer. But power is elusive. It comes and it goes. It's very elusive. It comes and it goes. So. This debt issue or this borrowing is something that we must watch. We must watch it closely. Because if we continue, Madam Speaker, very shortly, based on what I said before, I said that $102 million was not enough. We have reached $122 million in October. The Prime Minister spoke about $300,000 more, $200 million more. If we continue on, on that trajectory, this country, this country is going on a very, very fast, fast track down to the International Monetary Fund. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable members, the question is, that Parliament authorizes the Minister with responsibility for finance to borrow 
EC $15 million by way of credit in this resolution referred to as the credit from First National from First National Banks in Lucia Limited for capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget and that a interest on the principal amount of the credit is re repayable at the rate of 6% per annum due one month after the full drawdown and b the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $126,579 per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think. As a clever division, please. Madam Deputy Clerk, a revision is called for. Please proceed. Honorable Alan Chastney, how do you vote? Yes. Honorable Sean Edward, how do you vote? No. Honorable Dominic Fede, how do you vote? Honorable Sarah Flood Bobre, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Ernest Hillier, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Guy Joseph, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Stevenson King, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Philip J. Pierre, how do you vote? Aye. Honorable Herod Stanislas, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Honorable members, a division been haven't been called for. There are currently Ten members present in the chamber. Seven ayes and three noes. The ayes have it. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister, Leader of Government Business, Minister for Finance, Member for Miku South. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay the following motion standing in my name. And whereas it is provided by Section 391 of the Finance Administrative Act, Cap 1501, that the Minister responsible for finance may, by resolution of Parliament, borrow money from the bank or the financial institution for the capital expenditure of government. And whereas it is further provided by Section 2 of the Finance Administration Act, Cap 1501, that they shall be charged upon and paid out of the consolidated fund debt charges for which the government is liable. And whereas the Minister responsible for finance considers it necessary to borrow $25 million by the way of credit in this resolution referred to as the credit from the Bank of St. Lucia Limited for the capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. And whereas the interest on the principal amount of the credit is repayable at a rate of 6% per annum, and whereas the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $210,964.21, per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. Be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow $25 million by the way of credit in the resolution referred to as the credit from the Bank of St. Lucia, limited for capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. Be it further resolved that the interest payment of the principal amount of the credit is repayable at the rate of 6% per annum and the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $210,964.21 per month, inclusive of interest at 180 months. Madam Speaker, as I explained in the previous bill, and hopefully I didn't think I would have to educate or enlighten my colleague, member from, from Castries East, given his 
level of experience um, in the parliament. And certainly that his, his, his announce, announcements on a, on a regular basis of his understanding of accounting and also of economics. That we are not coming here to seek any additional monies. All we have done is come here and changed where we're going to borrow the money from. And we've explained ourselves. Talks about the confidence. There is an increased confidence in the government assembly. In fact, in fact, we could have floated the bonds, and the bonds would have gotten 7.65, 95% interest. And the reason for that, and when he talked about the increase in debt over the last decade, right? That side of the house, that Labour Party he talks about. <coughs> When they came in in 1997, Madam Speaker, the debt of the country was about $400 million. They added over $2 billion of debt to this country. Wow. $2 billion. And he's boasting about the fact that in the last year that he was able to reduce the, the, the primary deficit, he had no choice because nobody would lend him any money. The fact is, is when in 2003, Madam Speaker, we had about $30 million in treasury bills. Today, we have about $450 million in treasury bills because of the policies of the Labour government that everybody had lost confidence in what they were doing. I mean, to come to this house and, and, and to try to parade and suggest that we're borrowing any extra money, the minister knows how it works. I'm not coming here for a supplementary budget. The total amount of borrowings was approved in the appropriations bill. We were living within that. All we've decided to do is instead of taking bonds, we've decided to borrow the money from the banks and cheaper, and for a longer period of time. And not only that, that we've included in the payments the principal amounts on a monthly basis. So we don't find ourselves in the irresponsible policies of the Labour government, who took debt, spent the sinking fund, and when the debt came available, complained they didn't have the bullet amount to pay for it, and simply turned over the debt. So it means the cost of that original debt keeps, we keep paying for it. Because you still have it on your books and you're still paying the interest payments. I listen to my colleague. And I'm confused, Madam Speaker. I'm absolutely confused. When he talks about irresponsible statements, look at the statements they made about the CIP. Knowing how the democratic process works, that the changes to the CIP were made in Parliament, which is the highest authority in this country. But no that they go out publicly and say that they're not going to honor the decision made in Parliament and make it retroactive backwards. You don't think that that's an irresponsible statement, Madam Speaker? That how can a party that calls itself a party make that kind of statement? Reckless statements? Who made the statement there will be no rest? Who made the statement there will be no rest? And is that a fair statement to make? That in fact, if you cannot get your way that you're going to have protests and you're going to destroy things? That's how reasonable people think? You know, Madam Speaker, the Labour Party, and in particular, my colleague from Castries East, has one strategy. And that strategy is to be the victim. That we're all supposed to feel sorry for him because he's the victim. Right? And the allegations he's making about us that the Labour Party themselves have never put into practice those, those methods. Because I know that when it came to the distribution of CDP funds, the Labour Party was a shining beacon in fairness. I know that. Talking about borrowing money. So when you were doing the bolt programs, where was it on the debt? Okay. Where was it on the debt? Right. The other thing that's very interesting in Madam Speaker, that you would have expected a, my learned colleague, who is so experienced in parliamentary procedures, that if he genuinely wanted to know the answers to the questions that he was asking, 
There is a prescribed mythology to do so. So maybe, Madam Speaker, I would suggest that he is short on memory. And maybe when we go on recess, that you can take the opportunity and remind him of what that process is in order to be able to ask his questions. And I'll be very happy once he goes through that method to answer the questions that he has asked. But again, we have a social and economic review that is done independently of politicians in which gives an annual report on where we are. But any of the questions that he asks, there is a prescribed way to be able to do that. But suffice to say, Madam Speaker, that the borrowings that we're making are within the context of what we requested in the appropriations bill. There is no change. All that we've changed is instead of borrowing the money through bonds, we've agreed to borrow the money through the banks. And that the reason for doing so, Madam Speaker, is because now it's 6% instead of 7.65%, and we're getting it for 15 years. And that in the payments, we've also included the payments of the principal. So at the same time, Madam Speaker, we're paying off the debt that we have. In terms of the performance of the, of the, of the economy, I'm very satisfied that we're making significant strides in digging ourselves out of the hole that was left by the Labor Party. Madam Speaker, I only give it as an example of what we inherited. Imagine when we came in to find out that none of the Coast Guard boats were working. None. Zero. Zero. That in addition to the Coast Guard's boat not working, Madam Speaker, the forensic lab was closed. We had no DPP. In fact, simple things like photocopiers and ink and materials within the DPP's office did not exist. And the full complement of lawyers did not exist. Madam Speaker, hopefully there are many of the lawyers and the judges who are practicing in the judicial system. Where are our courts? That here we are in 2016 when we came into office, that judges did not have chambers, magistrates are working out of vehicles as their office, that we have some offices that we've put together, I call a makeshift courts. You go and you look at the condition of the schools, Madam Speaker. No money is being set aside. Look at the condition of our roads. And this is a government that's, that wants to be celebrated, that they're being victimized. The only people in this country who have been crying, Madam Speaker, have been the people. And the people who did not even recognize that those people were crying was the Labour Party. And in particular, the people that they say that they're the champions of. So when you look at the level of taxation that the government put in, there was no sensitivity to the man on the, on the ground. There was no sensitivity of the fact that the economy was not growing and you were expecting that that man on the ground was going to make the payment. That when you put a 15% VAT rate on and the small businesses now had to pay an increase in the amount of rent. You couldn't understand that. Where was the sensitivity then? That you spent $118 million on St. Jude's Hospital and we have nothing other than concrete to show for it. And they have three members on the other side who live in the South, who had no voice for five years, Madam Speaker. And today they want to speak. Today they want to go and march and go and see the hospitals. Are you really, is that real? And you want people to genuinely believe that you cared? How can that be, Madam Speaker? How can that be? And I can go down the list of things in this government that we found not working. You have an agricultural sector, an education sector. I went down to see the traffic department. No air conditioning, mold infested, broken down furniture. An audit report came out, Madam Speaker, that of all the tickets that are issued to the police stations, we only collect 5%. So even the accounting system within the government is broken. I have to ask myself, was it, what was the government doing? 
They cared so much. Better days. Where were they? And that's why we have to make the statement, better days for whom? Huh. But you know, Madam Speaker, it is not long before we find out who the better days were for. Because there's a lot of information that's going to be coming out in which the people of St. Lucia will be able to judge for themselves as to who the better days were for. But you know, Madam Speaker, I'm proud of my government. I'm proud of my government that my government came in and while we could have gone on a soapbox and made more light of all these issues, that we've chosen to take the limited hours that we have and the energy we have to resolve the problems. I want to congratulate my Minister of Tourism. Despite everything going on, that St. Lucia now has grown the second fastest in the Caribbean region. That we had real growth, 10% increase in arrivals. I hear the other minister, oh, that's not so good because that is, um, what's it called, the, the hotel? Um, Royalton. Yeah, but you know what? Royalton could have come in, discounted the prices, and if there wasn't the demand, it would have affected the other hotels. But we've not seen that. I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate you on the work that you've been doing in the cruise industry. That despite the fact that there's been construction taking place, right, that we've seen a 14% increase in arrivals. And my understanding is every single day, we're seeing new ships coming into San Lucio. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank my Minister of Agriculture, who has made a commitment to help the rural areas. I understand. When we talked about putting that extra ching, ching, ching in people's pockets, that's where it comes from. One step at a time, one policy at a time. We reduced the VAT by 12.5%. What did the other side say? Oh, nobody's seen the benefit. So how are you telling me that if you're paying rent and you were paying 15% VAT on the rent and today you're paying 12.5% on VAT and rent, who benefited? Who benefited? Who benefited? Who benefited? So what, it was better to leave the VAT at the 15% because people would have been better off if the VAT was at 15%. Is that what you're trying to say? I don't understand. You lower the tax. And there are so many people in the country who benefited from it. You know, the other thing that's interesting, and we've said it, you know, Madam Speaker, because the member from CAS 3 South always brings this up. Every time we have to have a borrowing bill, talks about, oh, you said you were never going to borrow. That's not what I never said, but it, guess what? Yeah, go and see my manifesto. Go and see the manifesto. It says that we will not borrow any money off of the existing recurrent revenue. And that any additional major borrowing that we're going to do has to come with its own revenue stream. So the money to do the roads came from by taking the step of putting on a $1.50 tax on gas and putting in a lockbox in order for us to be able to secure a loan. Ask, yeah, there's, there's a way of asking the question. No, no, you ask the question. You do it the right way. You do it the right way. And I'll, put, I'll give you the answer. You know there's a way to do it. Okay, that's not the way to do it, all right? You're being a bad example for the people of St. Lucia. There's a discipline and a right way to do it. Go and do it. The airport. We're going to have a discussion on the airport. Are you telling me that you want to go and give a third party, an international organization, the ability to manage our airport for us? And to add insult on injury? That we have to pay them to do it? So it's not the $35 to be able to construct the airport. The tax that they were proposing was $55. And the 20 extra dollars was to pay for an international organization to manage the airport for us. And you know, Madam Speaker, I know exactly what will happen. Wow. And I've been there. The international organization will come in, will fire the solutions who are working hard every day to make a bad airport work. <laughs> And instead of us celebrating what they have achieved, and I go there and I pass through and I see what they're going through. No, they're going to get fired and they're going to bring in international people and pay them maybe the same salary, if not higher, in US dollars. That's what's going to happen. Because that's where that money is going to go. But no, what we want to do is you have the tax, so there's a revenue stream for that money. And nobody is going to come and convince me 
or anybody on this side that we're irresponsibly increasing the debt because there's a revenue stream for that money. And we're going to build up the strength of the people that are there. We're going to give them more training. We're now going to give them a world-class airport that they can be proud of. And I want to see how well St. Lucians can do now that they have a proper airport. That's the difference, you know. We believe in the people of St. Lucia. You don't. You don't. All you know how to do, Madam Speaker, all my member from Cass Region knows is to cry. Cry victimization. Cry this, cry that. Okay? It's amazing. And the things that he's alleging on, the, on this side, he knows that these are the things that he himself was doing. And what I'm proud about my party is my party and my colleagues that we don't share in that. We believe that we're a government for the people of St. Lucia. And everybody must come. We've said it repeatedly. There's no reason that you're going to have 50% of the people benefiting one time and 50% of the people benefiting next time. We must have policies in which all St. Lucians benefit all the time. We believe in a tax system that is progressive. If you make more money, you should be able to pay more money. Talked about Digicel. I'm proud about what we've done about Digicel. But it's not only Digicel. We have six companies that are coming in. And what's interesting is that those people, if it were not for the incentives that we provided under the Headquarters Act, would not come to St. Lucia. I give you an example. I went to Geneva. I know that you all have been. I know particularly the former Minister of Foreign Affairs would have been to Geneva. 34,000 people work at the UN. All of them who are working there, tax-free. But what has it done for Geneva? They go out to restaurants, they go to the airports, they go to the grocery stores, they're paying their VAT, they're paying their consumption. And that's what we've already started seeing happen here, Madam Speaker. Because he talks about how do you create confidence. You create confidence by making tough decisions. You create confidence in understanding that you try to create confidence in what people are doing. So right now, we've seen now that the, the volume of vacant apartments and homes has literally been evaporated. And I know that in very short time, that business people will now start building homes because they recognize that the demand is there. And it's in the building of those homes and those apartments that you now start stimulating the economy because that is expenditure that is taking place not using government resources. And we're realizing that what we need to do is to become a more efficient government in order to be able to allow the private sector and the small businesses of this country to be the ones to make the investment. We have to resolve the situation with the banks. We have to resolve the situation with the debt of our country. We have to resolve the situation with the inefficiencies within government. How can I complain and chastise anyone in the civil service when we go and see the physical facilities that people are working on? Look at the parliament building we're in. Look at the offices you work out of, Madam Speaker. Look at the part where the parliament staff work. How many times have you had to move? Every day is another mold infestation. And where's that mold infestation come from, Madam Speaker? The lack of proper maintenance. And why do we have a lack of proper maintenance? Because there has been no money. And you're taking a little piece of money and you're trying to pay off as many things as you want as possible. So Madam Speaker, I, I, I stop at this point, but also to add one last thing. I cannot believe that an opposition, even though they were not successful, would vote against borrowing monies from indigenous banks at 6% in 15 years. And that as the, minister, as, as the other side knows, they've already approved the appropriations bill. So this is not any extra borrowing that we're doing. So I have to say to you that this is the type of gamemanship um, and, and dirty politics, insincerity, that really we need to depart from. And really now to be able to address the real issues that we have in our country. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister responsible for finance to borrow EC 25 million 
dollars by way of credit in this resolution referred to as the credit from the Bank of St. Lucia Limited for capital expenditure to, fin to finance the 2017-2018 budget. And that A, interest on the pr principal amount of the credit is repayable at the rate of 6% per annum, and B, that the principal amount of the credit is repayable in the amount of EC $210,964.21 per month, inclusive of interest for 180 months. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister nearly bursts his, bursts his brain. Bursts his brain. He's so excited. I thought he would start to cry. I thought he'd start to cry. <coughs> Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister is out of place. First of all, he cannot tell me where and how to ask questions. I ask questions in this honorable house where I was elected by the people of Castries East more times than him. I ask questions in this honorable house. In the Prime Minister's response, he hasn't answered one question. He hasn't said how much is in the sinking fund. He hasn't said how much is in the lockbox for fuel. He has not said what are the growth prospects of the economy. He's just coming with a big charade, grand charge, trying to threaten people, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister will not threaten me. Neither will he ever threaten anybody on this side. Madam Speaker, I come back to the points that I ask. And I request answers from the Prime Minister. Number one, the Prime Minister Last week, said civil servants cannot sink. But today, he's lamenting that they work under conditions. He said they couldn't sink. The, the, this Prime Minister, he said so. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister says that the repayments of interest and principal together is because the banks have confidence. The opposite. The banks want their money. The banks want you to pay interest and principal together so there can be a reduction of the loan. They could ask you to pay interest on one side and principal on the other side. That's how most banks do it. But to ensure that they get repayments, they have put both capital and interest together in, in the repayments. That is why. It's not because of any confidence they had or any, any macroeconomic policy that you are speaking about. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister has not said how much is in the lockbox account for fuel? <coughs> he has not said it. I need to know how much is in the lockbox account for fuel. There is no standing order that, that can say that an elected member cannot ask questions of the Minister of Finance. Not a formal question time. In the course of a debate, I'm asking, I'm asking for responses to some of the things you said. Respond to what you said. The Prime Minister speaks about a reduction in facts. The Prime Minister knows very well that businesses that get, that earn less than $400,000 per month gross income do not pay that. So when you come and you speak about rent, the regular person who is renting a house doesn't pay any VAT on his rental income. It's because you know to pay VAT, your income must be $400,000 per month or more. So if you do not earn $400,000 a month, you do not, a year, you do not pay any VAT. So if you're paying $2,000 rent, you don't pay VAT on $2,000 rent. That is again, again, trying to fool people with talk. The people who benefit are those who their income in rent is more than $400,000 per year. These are the people who benefit, not those who get less than $400,000 per year in rent. The Prime Minister speaks about a few minutes ago, he was in his pious cells. The hotels and the cruise ships can't come because Puerto Rico is down. Now he says it's because of the Minister of Tourism, cruise ships, I, 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 cruise ship numbers are increasing. A few minutes ago, he said that because of the situation in Puerto Rico, that cruise ships have issues. Now, a few minutes after, he says it's because of the Minister of Tourism, cruise ships are coming. A few minutes ago, he said so. But you see, in one hand, on the one hand, he, he plays the he plays the simplificat, and on the other hand, the same way, he refused to tell his ministers. They cannot say that opposition members must cry. He supports it. 
He comes and speaks out, and he supports that man's speaker. And he comes and, and plays as if he wants to cry because he likes St. Lucia so much. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, speaks about the conditions of police stations and prisons. The Prime Minister wasn't involved in politics when we built the Marsha police station, when we built the Viewfort police station, when we built the police stations in Denry, when we built the Marigo police station, when we repaired the Sufre police station. No, the Richmond police station. He wasn't there. He wasn't in politics. He was somewhere else. He's just, he's just arrived recently. So now he speaks about police stations. Where was the prime minister when we were building fire stations? Where, where, where was he? Where was the prime minister when the policemen in Marigo, Yusuf and Sufre had to share toilets, particularly in Marigo? The situation in Marigo. Where was the prime minister? He wasn't there. He wasn't around. He's just recently arrived. So he doesn't know anything about the conditions of police stations. He doesn't know anything about it. Some members of the cabinet know. So don't talk about police stations, fire stations. I, I agree. There needs to have improvements in police stations. But nobody will come in here and grant charge and, and pretend as if police stations, you are the ones who have to create, who have to repair police stations. Say what you found. This government, our government, we are the ones who improved the physical conditions and built new police stations and new fire stations. It's a loser. This government. This government, man, speaker. Then he speaks about he speaks about prisons. Who built the bodily prison? Who built the bodily prison? He had to borrow, and I want to go back in the borrowing profile. Because you talk about borrowing 400 million dollars in 1997, and what happened now? Let I'll take you back to what we borrowed for. I'll take you back. We are the ones who had to build the bodily prison. And some of your own ministers were very happy when the bodily prison was being built. We, we, we built it. We had to borrow to build it. We were the ones who had to borrow to build five new secondary schools to get the children of St. Lucia, give, give them at least an opportunity to go to secondary school. We had to borrow for that. We had to borrow for that. We had to borrow to build the, the police stations. We had to borrow to build the fire stations. We had to borrow for that. So, and I'll tell you something. You speak about bonds, man speaker. The prime minister, he knows very well. He knows extremely well, or you should know, that the situation in the bond market was caused because of two countries in the region that were going through IMF structural adjustment programs. And each one of them had to take a cut in the bond rate. So the confidence in bonds fell because these two countries were under IMF programs. So the whole region was seen as a region of high risk because of the IMF, because of the issues with bonds in these two countries. They, now these two countries, they've swallowed the IMF medicine, so there's renewed confidence in the region. St. Lucia doesn't borrow as itself. St. Lucia borrows in the regional securities market. So what affects the entire region? affects us. So the only reason why your bonds may, may be selling better now is because two or three countries in the region went for an IMF structural adjustment program. So the situation has improved. So that is what has changed the level of confidence in the bonds. Not because of any policy of, the, of, of, of your government. The, the, the prime minister comes here and speaks about marching. This prime minister, when there's no position, he said there were dialysis machines at the hospital. And he will march to the hospital and stay there until they open this dialysis machine. The same prime minister, don't come and play this pious thing on me. Don't try that. The same prime minister said he would march. He would march to the Orient Hospital. And, he, and we would remain there. And he said in part, man, fashé. So don't, 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 don't pretend in this, this, this pious pretense as if you, you, are, you, are all, you are all holy and then you like the people of St. Lucia so much. You said you would march. You talk about CIP. You wrote letters when CIP was coming into place. You wrote letters all over the region. All over, you said that you would form a body that would be made up of the private sector of people from it. And you, you created a, the, the, the CIP board the same way you, you, you made no changes. You were the one who started the, the darkness CIP. You, not us. What we said is we said because of the changes in the CIP program, because of the fact that you, and if only yesterday, the Prime Minister sent kids, said he, he, he's not following you. He, he will not re reduce the prices. He said so. He did not. He was the one who said so. You were the one who began the doubt in the CIP by your letters and your petty politics. You were the one in opposition. So don't try and pretend as now that it's us. You started it. 
You were the one, man, speaker. You were the one. You were the one who spoke about marching to the Owen Hospital. You started. You were the one. And, I, and I'm happy. I want you to go into St. Jude Hospital. I want you to go into St. Jude Hospital. You, want, you must go there. You say me, you must go into the airports. You always come and threaten people. Come and go. go. Go into it. Do what you have to do. Go into St. Jude Hospital. Don't threaten people. Go into it. You are the one. And you, 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 you speak at the forensic lab. You were the one who said, you were the one who said that St. Jude should not have a forensic lab. That the forensic lab should go regionally. You said so when you were in opposition. And you, and you know very well that the forensic lab got damaged because of the earthquake, earthquake. And you know very well the problems at the forensic lab. And you also know that when you came into power, an audit of the forensic lab had been done. And you know very well that all you are doing is you are just following the results of the audit of that forensic lab. You know that very well. So again, do not come in this honorable house and try to play on people's emotions, man speaker. You know very well, man speaker. You know. Then you speak about, you speak about courts. You speak about the, the courts. Again, you know again, you are very, you should know that getting money to build these kind of buildings are very difficult. Getting concession finance for that is very difficult. You, 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 Prime Minister, you ought to know that. And you also know that when you came into government, you found well advanced plans to begin the construction of a hall of justice on the Millennium Highway. You know that very well. If you if, if it's to change it, that's your fault. But you know that. You know that. Further, Madam Speaker, you speak about taxation. You speak about taxation, Madam Speaker. And, you know, the, the, the surprising thing about this government is in the face of all the facts and the reality, they still believe they can talk themselves away or they can threaten somebody or they can say something that will, will cause somebody to be afraid. Oh, we're coming for you. We're coming for you. Come for us. Come. So, my, so Madam Speaker, the, the Prime Minister, in the face of all the facts, you borrowed $40 million dollars for the Denry water supply. You borrowed $30 million. For, you borrowed $40 million for the tourism project. You borrowed $30 million for the Denry water supply. You are borrowing $4.3 million for the DVRP. You borrowed $7.5 million for the youth empowerment. If you add that, if you can, you'll get $86.6 million. And if you add the $40 million you're borrowing today, It'll come to $122.6 million. And the document you have in front of this honorable house is you want, to, you want to have $103 million for financing of the 2017 budget. That is a fact. I'm not saying you can't you can borrow more, but it's a fact. You are borrowing more than, you, than when you came to this honorable house on the 27th of June and you said you needed... $103 million for financing of 2017-2018 budget. That's a fact. And you also said in that resolution that you want $262 million for refinancing of the existing debt. And I said to you that what you were doing was wrong because you would have to come back to this honorable house to borrow more money because $103 million would not be enough. And history has proved me right. And regardless of whatever you say, the facts are the facts. That is the money that you borrowed. And you came in this honorable house with a resolution for $103 million. And at that time, I told you that you would have to, to borrow more. And you are borrowing more. So, Madam Speaker, all this grand charge and this emotion and this thing about how we found the country, you must understand, when you came, you going to come in 2016, you found an economy that the trajectory had begun to improve. When we came in 2011, when you came to government in 2016, all the facts show it. The IMF reports, the, you, you know, you, you, commissioned, you commissioned a report from the, the CDB. You commissioned a report. I'm talking to you guys. You, you commissioned a, a report on... Don't interfere in that, man. You commissioned a report by the, the, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank on the economy. And if you look at that report, 
they will tell you, first page, executive summary, notwithstanding the improvement in fiscal performance in the past four years. See Appendix 1. First page, we always make the point that the economy needed some structural changes. We always agree to that. But do not give people the impression that when you came into government, you found an, eco an economy that, that, that was in such dire straits that you could do nothing. And it's you and your people and the hard work and the way you can go outside and travel that you made St. Lucia so good and give us time to improve St. Lucia. You are the one. You found an economy that was improving. It was not where it ought to be, but it was improving. Then you talk about tourism growth. I want to put it to you. I want to put it to you. That most hotels in this country, most hotels in this country, have shown a decrease in arrivals. Most of them. Do not speak about the small hotels. Don't talk about the small hotels and guest houses. Don't, don't, don't speak about them. The reason why, and the facts will prove me right, the reason why this country has shown an improvement in tourism numbers and I'm not vexed about that. You pretend as if I'm annoyed because tourism numbers increase. I'll be in my constituency working at Royalton. Why if I want not, not to work? But it's where your mind is. It's where the mind, you understand? Why would I be annoyed if you work in the hotels? Why would I be annoyed? But the facts are, the only reason why there's an increase in the hotel visitor arrivals is because the Royalton Hotel brought in 500 new rooms into the room, into the room store. That's a fact. I'm not saying arrivals have not increased, but they've increased because of the 500 rooms that have come into stock from the Royalton. And because two or three other hotels have high occupancies. But I mean, that is not something you can change. Then you can't change it. That's a fact. And you ask, ask the questions the, the right place. It's the arrogance that has seeped into you so soon. How can you tell a member of parliament when to ask questions? This is the parliament of the people. This is where the people elected us to put us in government. We have a right to ask anything you want here. We have a right to ask anything you want here. So you can't tell us when to ask or what to ask, Madam Speaker. We are going to ask questions in the parliament about the performance of the economy of St. Lucia. So, Madam Speaker. Standing order. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, on the section 14 of the standing orders. Yes. Standing Order 14, Nature of Questions, and then on the section 15 and 15, 2, 1 and 2, highlights the method of asking questions. Madam Speaker, it is clear on this that a question shall not be asked without prior notice unless it is of urgent character or relates to the business of the day. Now, Madam Speaker, if the member for Castries East is going to accuse the Prime Minister or the member for Mikud South of saying that he, he is disrespecting him by telling him how to answer or when to ask questions, then the member is not following the rules established in the question and on the, the section of the standing orders that explains how questions can be asked. And the member should desist from persisting along that line of saying that you cannot ask me questions or you cannot tell me I cannot ask you a question. If the standing orders makes it very clear as to the method and procedures of asking questions. Honorable Minister and Member for Castry Southeast, whilst I take the point that you, you, you raise 
This refers to questions in general when a member would ask any minister for questions, regarding questions. So, you are correct to state that there is a procedure for asking questions. However, this is the procedure for asking questions generally. For example, the point that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is asking the Prime Minister questions which he believes pertinent to the Prime Minister's portfolio in respect of a motion for borrowing which he puts on the floor and that is currently being debated. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition has the right to put questions to the Prime Minister in that regard. The, the, the point that I wish to clarify is the, with respect to the general, 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 the general point on questions, the nature of questions, it is if, for example, a member of the opposition wishes to put questions to the Minister for Agriculture, or yourself, for example, not on a matter currently being debated on the floor. Are you understanding my point? So this is, this is in respect to the interpretation of the point on questions, how questions are put. Not, it is not in regard or in respect to questions put by a member in response to whether it's a motion or a bill being currently debated on the floor. So the, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition is correct to ask the Prime Minister, who is the Minister with responsibility for finance, to ask him questions regarding financial matters as regards borrowing and the motion on the floor. I have so ruled, sir. Honorable Prime Minister, can I, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, can I take the intervention, please? Madam Speaker, while I clearly understand what you're saying, the, the, the fact, the fact, the fact is, Madam, the fact is, Madam Speaker, Madam, Madam Speaker, is that if in fact the kinds of questions he wants to ask are questions that must be put to me in writing, they have absolutely nothing um, to do with um, the bill. Honorable that Prime passing. Minister, and can I'm I have a no moment, please? Honorable no Prime Minister, to answer them. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I clearly said that I would want the, to be, I would want the Prime Minister to be heard. So I did. I, I requested and I said that I would want the Prime Minister to be heard. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't want to be accused of not wanting to answer questions, Madam Speaker. And I just want to clarity on, on the point that you made. If the Honorable Member wants to ask me questions that are factual questions about the state of the economy, my understanding is, is that those are the questions that can be put to me. If in fact he's raising questions, the questions he's asking have nothing to do with the bill that we're passing. And in fact, I'm under no obligation to answer any question that he puts in that format. Versus if he puts a written request to me, I'm obligated to answer those questions. So I'm saying to my, my learned colleague, Madam Speaker, if he wants me to answer those questions, Put it in the form of writing, and I'll be very happy to answer those questions. But if he's going to put it and try to phrase it in the way that he's not, I have no obligation to answer him in, the, in those circumstances. Prime Minister, and I will respond and say to you that you are incorrect in your interpretation of it, in that when we're talking about borrowing, which is a motion that you have on the floor, and that you have put, and is being debated, all of this forms part of the debate. Madam Speaker, again, I'm going to rise to disagree with you. Prime Minister. Be because, because what I'm asking, Madam Speaker, did we not have an appropriations bill? Did the amount that we were going to borrow not approve the appropriations bill? And I'm at pains to say to everybody again, including the, the, my, my, my learned colleague, 
that we are not borrowing any money outside of what we've been approved in the appropriations bill. And so therefore, I don't understand how what he is asking comes into play. But they are relevant questions. And if he wants me to answer those questions on the economy, there is a process for him to do so. And that is, man, he can write, and I will take those, and I will come to the House, and I'm obligated to answer what he writes. My mic is still on. I wish to remind honorable members of this house that as speaker of this house, I am the authority on the rules, and I'm not going to say that I'm not, I may not be wrong, but I wish to remind honorable members that this mace recognizes and is the symbol of my authority of this house, and if I rule on a point, members are duty bound to understand that I have so ruled. This is all I'm going to say on this matter at this moment. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, please proceed. Madam Speaker, I want to bring the member of Cassius Southeast back to the meeting of the 8th December 2015. If you can go, go in hands up, you will see the amount of questions he has. And, and, and no, no one stopped him. But Madam Speaker, this is, that is the problem we have. The Prime Minister got up and he asked me endless questions. He accused me. Everything I said, he accused me. He asked me on the screen. He said I was misleading. And now he wants to tell me the form in which, in a debate for to borrow $40 million, which the taxpayers have to pay, I cannot ask what's the state of the economy. I have to write you to ask you that. What, what country we, we, we are living in? So, Madam Speaker, and I repeat, the, the document I have in my hands, says $103 million for financing, June the 27, 2017. And to date, we've bought $122.6 million. I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm saying it's a fact. So, it never said bonds here. It does not say bonds. It said a summary for financing. And if you go back to the budget, and if you go back to the Prime Minister's budget statement on the 40 on on page 44, here's what he says: Other loans totaling 43.1 million from the Caribbean Development Bank, 24.9 million from the World Bank, 13.6 million from the Republic of China Taiwan, 1 million from National Insurance Corporation, 2.2 million from the Creative Fund for Arab and Economic Development. And it goes further: Government instruments. That's where it is. Government instruments, including bonds, 208 million, and treasury bills of 50 million. That's what he said. And he said loans were, were for 84 million. That's what the budget statement says. That's what it says. I'm not saying what he's doing is illegal. I'm saying that I said that you have to come back here to borrow more. And he's coming back to borrow more. That, that, that's a fact. Because you borrowed 122 million dollars, and here you have 102 million dollars. That, 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 that's what we said. The facts speak for themselves. The facts speak for themselves. So, um, so I'm speaking now. Talking now. So, I want to, I want to put it to you, Madam Speaker, that the impression that the Prime Minister is given is that he found this country in a, in a, in a state of disrepair. I am saying 
that when the prime minister became prime minister, the country all wasn't bright and rose in the country. We admitted that. But we said that the country was on the verge. There were signs of improvement for many reasons. Reason number one, the regional and international situation was changing. I have made the point that because of the bond situation, where free, I don't want to mention any, any country's name, free countries were under structural adjustment. These countries had to take a haircut on their bonds. That means that if the bond was worth $20, they had to go to the creditor and say, listen to me, I'll pay you 15 So the whole confidence in the regional market was lacking. These countries have come out of the problems because the IMF structural adjustments. So the entire region is benefiting from that change because we buy our bonds on the regional security market. So to come here to grandstand and to say because of you, you in government, there's more confidence, that isn't true. That's, that, that's all I'm saying. So, Madam Speaker, regardless of what will be said, regardless of the grandstanding, regardless of the appearance of piousness and self-righteousness. The point is, this country right now is not experiencing, the people of the country are not feeling any sense of economic development or economic growth. They are not feeling it. The, the so-called development or the growth is not being felt in the pockets of the people of St. Lucia. And the people of St. Lucia, the people of St. Lucia, the Chamber of Commerce said that sales have increased. They never said profits have increased. The Chamber of Commerce said, and the, and, and the reason why sales have increased, sales can increase for several reasons. Sales can increase because the cost of goods imported are higher. And if you go, in fact, when you spoke about confidence, the cost of imported goods are higher. When you went, somebody told me, I got an, uh, an, an email from someone. And they said to me that they had bought butter for a particular price. And when they went back to the supermarket, the butter had gone up by $2. And if you speak to the regular housewife, she will tell you that prices in the supermarket have gone up. Not because of you. I'm not blaming you for that. I'm not blaming you for that. But I'm saying, and when the price of these goods go up, the volume of sales will increase because they pay more for the goods. He, if that said profit increase, it's not quantity demanded. He does said profit increase. I'm not, but I'm not querying that. Demanded. I'm not querying that. So what I'm saying to you, is don't, 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 don't come and take credit for that. Don't take credit for it. The Chamber of Commerce said sales have increased. The Chamber of Commerce never said that profits have increased. And a measure of business, and a measure of business is profits. Revenue maximization. So if the sales increase, if the sales increase, and the cost of sales increase. If the sales increase That's and the cost of sales economics. increase also, there is no effect on profit. If the sales increase and the cost of sales increase, there is no effect on profit. So when the Chamber of Commerce says sales increase, they never said profits have increased. So don't come and boast about that. Don't boast about it. You, you, you're on track. You're on the ball. Mm. Madam Speaker, he's, he's on I, intended, he's on I intended this morning I intended this morning, as I started, to have a civil debate on, 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 on the borrowing. But when the Prime Minister gets up and is in his, in, in, his, in his normal style and believes that he's speaking to school children and believes he can attack members of the side and believes he's a master, that if he says things that people must shut up, I have to, I have to, I have, I have to get on. If the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister can't believe that he can shut me up, he can't. And he can't threaten me either. And I'm saying to the Prime Minister, I reserve the right to speak in this parliament. I reserve the right within the standing orders to obey the standing orders. And all you can do is victimize me. I thank you. Honorable Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for tourism, information, and broadcasting. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, when I woke up this morning, I thought that we would be here discussing the business of the people. And Madam Speaker, we would try to come up with common sense solutions 
to the many problems affecting our country at this time. But Madam Speaker, we came into the House and what we got was the usual opposition petty politics, the usual opposition misrepresentation of the facts, and the quoting of figures conveniently to send a certain message that they would want to suit their political agenda. Madam Speaker, I think that it's important that I clarify a few things, and they relate to how we met the economy when we came in, and when the people of St. Lucia entrusted this government with their hopes and their aspirations of prosperity and employment and a better life, Madam Speaker. We met unemployment, Madam Speaker, hovering for most of the four years, well over 20%. And all the genius that the leader of the opposition has just ascribed to uh, the tenure of his government, um, Madam Speaker, youth unemployment was at 40%. Madam Speaker, in some cases, it was almost uh, twice in one in every two uh, youth that you find in the country were unemployed. Were, it was almost 50% in many instances. Madam Speaker, the debt levels were high. The Prime Minister mentioned that the growth figures were extremely low. In fact, the Social Economic Review um, stated that in the last 10 years, the economy grew by a mere 1.3%, Madam Speaker. Merely not enough for us to use this kind of surplus or opportunity and create uh, the kind of development thrust that we would need in the country. Madam Speaker, many businesses close as a result of some of the failed policies of the St. Lucia Labour Party administration. And Madam Speaker, more fundamentally, there was a lack of hope, there was despair, Madam Speaker, in uh, the people of this country in the tenure and the leadership of the previous St. Lucia Labour Party administration. Madam Speaker, I heard much was said um, about the hotel numbers which grew, and I am happy to say that St. Lucia is, the Prime Minister is correct, the second fastest growing tourist destination in the Caribbean. And that is not, that is not good news for everyone. You see, the people who are genuinely interested in St. Lucia going forward, and the people who are genuinely interested in seeing this country and the livelihood, livelihoods of its people improve, those people, Madam Speaker, will find that to be good news. But when there are politicians who have agendas and who are constantly trying to destabilize the progress of the country, I call them enemies of progress, Madam Speaker. Those people who will try to create scare tactics and try to send the wrong information about government policies that really what we're doing is trying to position St. Lucia on a different path. Much was said about the value added tax, about why did we reduce the tax? And we said we were gonna start at reducing the tax by 2.5%, Madam Speaker, from 15 to 12.5%, which would represent a 16% decrease in the tax. Now, the opposition would like to say, we lost $52 million, $52 million. But they were the same people that while they were in opposition were saying that this tax was oppressive to poor people. And Madam Speaker, we share that view. A 15% rate of VAT is untenable. A 15% rate of VAT, we've had five years to measure the results. And the results has done a number of things. It has spiraled unemployment, it has contracted economic growth, and it has sent a low level of confidence in this country, Madam Speaker. And so you couldn't continue with a policy just because it is a policy instituted by the St. Lucia Labour Party and continue with that same policy if you want to change this country. And the same can be said for the CIP, Madam Speaker. It was not performing. And when you look at the CIP report, Madam Speaker, it showed you that in the first... Uh, uh, eight months of the program, 
it was almost bankrupt. There were deficits, Madam Speaker. We came in and we saw the revenue performance of the program improving substantially, as indicated, Madam Speaker, by the latest CIP report. That is progress. So when the plans and the policies are not changing, you can't be political about them. If they are not working, then you ought to change them so that you bring about development and you bring about opportunity for the people of our country. And so we spoke about the cruise lines. Of course the cruise lines started performing well. When we came into the tourist board, it was said to me that um, there was ambiguity in which uh, government agency should take the lead on the cruise strategy uh, for the country. Relationships were lost. People didn't attend the cruise conferences with any level of frequency. There wasn't a clear marketing plan for the cruise industry. Everyone focused on the airlines and focused on uh, filling the hotels. That's not a bad thing, that's great. But not at the expense of the many taxi drivers and the vendors and the people at the market and the various stakeholders at the sites and attractions who benefit from the hundreds of thousands of cruise passengers who come to this country. And what did we do, Madam Speaker? We went and we rebuilt old relationships. We went and we said to them that we are going to invest, Madam Speaker, in the birth at Point Serafin. And Madam Speaker, despite the interruptions which came about with the construction during the season, we still see, Madam Speaker, uh, improving from a 0.9% uh, flat growth to a 22% year-to-date growth, Madam Speaker, in the cruise industry. It's not good news for everyone. And so, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister is right. Didn't happen by accident. Some other exciting things that we're doing. We've been to the market, and every travel study shows that people are looking for more experiences. They're looking for more experiential travel. And we have had the foresight. We went and we hired a company called Translation out of the United States. And we said it is time for St. Lucia to reposition the brand, Madam Speaker. All of this happened within a short year. When we came in, there was a debt of $10 million. And I'm not just going to mention the debt, but I'm, I want to mention the debt to show, Madam Speaker, why uh, we weren't able to successfully market the destination. Because every single uh, PR company, our stakeholders, a number of them, Madam Speaker, had canceled contracts and refused to do any marketing promotions with us because we didn't have the money to pay them to do it. St. Lucia Tourist Board had received a bad reputation in the marketplace. And Madam Speaker, we had to come in in quick time to restructure the organization, to reduce the debt. And I'm very proud of the team. I want to say, Madam Speaker, that in a short space of time, they have reduced the debt from 10 million to 2 million Eastern Caribbean dollars. And now we are able to sign with our tour operators. Now we are able to sign with our top suppliers so that we don't compromise the uh, tourist arrivals to our country. These are some of the things I must explain to the leader of the opposition that has happened. It didn't just happen by accident. It was hard, dedicated, committed work that we have done. And so, Madam Speaker, much, but I just told you, I just told you, the, 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 the member here would like us to continue in the old, unsustainable model of spending over a third of the board's budget. That's his claim to fame of being a tourism expert. Spend 14 million out of 34 on a festival where the international press didn't and continue to dwindle in interest, Madam Speaker. The level of PR which we got from it when the uh, Prime Minister was the Director of Tourism, a festival that would cost $3 million, was now costing 14. But back in the day, Madam Speaker, he had relationships with BET. He had a television component, Madam Speaker, which showed and brought about that visibility for the Jazz Festival as it was, Madam Speaker, created for it to be the island's main tourism marketing event. I have said here before that the Prime Minister, I'm proud of him because he was there in the infant stages of the Jazz Festival and could have said that this is my project. But he has now come to this honorable house and said that this project, which I was instrumental in helping to see its genesis, it's not working 
we need to scrap it and come up with new ideas to promote the country. And that is all we're saying. But no, they want to play politics. They want to do all kinds of things and say that we're killing the jazz festival and, and we're not patriotic and we're giving the country away to foreigners. It's called strategic marketing, my friend. And study the course one day. But Madam Speaker, this is the path that we're on to change this country, to come up with a range of common sense solutions so that we can address the many pitfalls that we have inherited from the previous administration. The impact on, on VAT, on the economy, we, we've said it. Mention was made of the Chamber of Commerce survey. If there is increased sales, it means that consumer confidence is also increasing. People are obviously buying more. That is why, perhaps, that the chamber members are expressing confidence, the majority of them. It's not our survey. We didn't say it. The Chamber of Commerce said it. But you don't want to hear that. You have your people on Facebook attacking them, you know, trying to undermine an organization that is independent from, from the government. And so these are the good news. Why do we always have to be bearer of bad news? Why does politics always have to be so nasty? Why does it always have to be so petty? You guys have come here over and over. And when you, when you, when you, when you, right, were in government, you came to this house and borrowed to finance your budget, right? You, you, you refused to say that it's $103 million budgeted in bonds, right? A lot of the, the projects you quoted a World Bank loan project, so like the tourism competitive project for 15 million US, that's about 40 million EC. That's from the World Bank project. Uh, it, it began on the your administration. It, it, and, and so it, yeah, it is a loan, but, but, but it is not a bond. And, and, and in the budget we said that our budget for bonds are $103 million. So come on, you're supposed to know better. So don't come with convenient quotations and, and all kind of theatrics. This is not a play. We are here discussing serious business. How do we take the country forward? Common sense solutions. You know, mention is being made about a, a, a primary surplus. What is a primary surplus? You've had overall deficits for all of your entire tenure in government. That is the actual picture of the accounting equation. Overall deficits. So, yes, if you subtract your interest payments, of course you're going to have a surplus, but that is not the true picture of government's total liabilities. You've still got to go and pay very, very high interest rates. And this is a very serious scenario which confronts our country, one that we've inherited from you. You know, you said, I noticed you stopped saying it because we've, we've showed that it was incorrect to suggest that the deficit which we, have actually um, instituted in, in this budget is, is on par with what you have done in 2015. In fact, yours is 7 million more than our 2016-2017 uh, budget. So governments running deficits, there's nothing abnormal about this, right? There, there's, there's nothing that is rare. What is really happening is that we have abandoned your failed austerity project and we have embraced a program of growth. We're going to stimulate this economy. We've seen growth in the productive sectors. And what, what you have to realize is where the money is being spent, right? And look at the Ministry of Agriculture. And look at the budgetary, budgetary allocations in agriculture. I'm so proud. You know, Ezekiel, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, my Honourable constituents, member. Honourable Member, um, for, for Babano. I want to thank you on behalf of my constituents. You are the best thing since sliced bread. They love your farmer subsidy to the subsidies, um, uh, honorable member for Babano, right? Which your ministry has instituted to reduce the fertilizer cost by two thirds. Last year it was $100 and now it's 30 something dollars. I am very, very proud. There's farmer confidence and I have no surprise why you see such exponential growth within the agriculture sector. The other good thing you're doing that they're telling me is that the black cigatopa oil is uh, the subsidy that you've made it cheaper for them to 
deal with pests and certain issues is going to buttress and stimulate production and stimulate economic growth and stimulate job opportunities for people in rural communities. This is what it's all about. I can't wait for you to implement the, the feeder road uh, program, which will do very, very well in the advancement of, of the farms to make uh, them more productive. We will see higher yields per acreage. And this is what we have to do. Give us an idea. Give us a sensible idea that we can implement now. And I promise you, we will do it. But when I come and I listen to all the theatrics, I feel that you guys are blank and all you can do is to cause mischief in this country. All you can do is to try to scare people and come up with lies and come up with all kinds of things. Like the 97 vehicle aspersion. You know, he wouldn't deny to say, well, there's a cabinet conclusion which has been circulated showing clearly that uh, there are four vehicles. And it is normal. A former minister of tourism knows better. Because in his time, I'm sure that he would have extended concessions to hoteliers. The, the law is there. The Tourism Incentive Act is nothing new. It has been there since 1998. It, it benefits small hotels. It benefits people who want to do uh, bread and breakfast and inns. It, it's there for everybody. It's there for tourism recreational facilities. It's there for sites and attractions. It's there for various tourism projects. Don't make it seem like Alan Chastney and his friends are giving away the country to hoteliers. Come on, friends. Come on. Come on, honorable members. You can do better than that. Let's rise to a higher level. Let's come up with solutions as to how we can take this country forward. The aspiration uh, by the honorable member for Castries South, we are cheapening St. Lucia. But, but, but forget to tell everyone that when his CIP program came, the failed one, right, that it was below St. Kitts. St. Kitts was at 400,000, okay? The real estate component. He put St. Lucia's at 350,000. Why is that? The sugar industry diversification program in St. Kitts was at 250,000. You put St. Lucia's at 200,000. Why is that? Because you're selling the same product and you realize that if you continue at the same level, coming to the market late with well-established programs in Dominica, in St. Kitts, in Antigua, and what was the other jurisdiction? I forgot, there was another one, Grenada. Then therefore, my friend, you have to do something about pricing. And that is it, you did the same thing, and we're more or less doing the same thing as well. But starting where we have started does not mean that when St. Lucia establishes its program that we cannot increase the price. It's called revenue yield. It's called revenue management. And that's what we're doing on this side, making sure that we gain the interest of the CIP, make sure we establish ourselves in the market, and make sure that St. Lucia's program is well promoted before we start talking about all the things that you're talking about. So Madam Speaker, I support the um, decision here. It's a very normal and simple. All we're doing is financing the budget, as stated. Uh, there's nothing complicated. We're not boring St. Lucia um, to hell. That's not what we're doing. Stop making those suggestions. We're not, we're not here trying to uh, create a, a fiscal cliff for the government. No, that's not what we're doing. We are here trying to borrow money to capitalize our budget so that we can spend money in agriculture, so that farmers in rural areas can benefit, so that we can start our, our uh, tourism project the biggest component of that project is for the vendors at the market, Madam Speaker. A total uh, reconstruction, a reconfiguration, a redesign, uh, improvement and enhancement of the market and the surrounding areas so that when we have a million cruise passengers next year, and I know this is not good news for everybody because I have some honorable members to my right who just love bad news. When we have a million tourist path, tourism uh, cruise passengers next year. What you will see are vendors who are better positioned to benefit from the development, the enhancement, the training, and the uh, infrastructure that we would have put in place to ensure that the surrounding, the aesthetics of the market is improved. Madam Speaker, I thank you very much. We are a government of progress.
Honourable Member for Denry North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, permit me to begin by making reference to something you cited in your opening statement when you mentioned Junior Creole celebrations. Madam Speaker, I want to place on the record my appreciation to the people of the Mabuya Valley, Larissus in particular, for hosting Junior Creole 2017. And notwithstanding the fact, Madam Speaker, that we had thousands and thousands of people who came into our community to celebrate with us, there wasn't a single incident reported that made the work of the police more difficult than it ought to have been. I think it's a reflection of the maturity of our people, Madam Speaker, and I think I should preface my short contribution to this debate um, with that particular comment. Madam Speaker, as a true patriot and someone who has a vested interest in the well-being of our country, I wish the situation confronting St. Lucia today was as favorable and as rosy as presented by the Prime Minister and the member for ancillary canneries. Madam Speaker, it is obvious that the reality on the ground is at variance with a lot of the pronouncements that have been made in here. A lot of forecasting, a lot of projections, Madam Speaker, and the government is trying to give hope to a population in which people, Madam Speaker, are crying for relief, where people are looking for escape routes from the challenges that confront them today. Madam Speaker, I'm happy that today we had a change in disposition by the member for ancillary canneries. There were no insults, and you could have seen that he tried very desperately, Madam Speaker, to be constructive, even though a lot of what he said um, would not find favor with us on this side of the House. And so we must commend him, Madam Speaker, for the marked improvement in behavior. Madam Speaker, a point that was made earlier on by the leader of the opposition. Last night, it was drawn to my attention very late, Madam Speaker, that there were changes to the other paper and that four pieces of legislation that were down for first reading only, Madam Speaker, would be going through all three stages today. I think, Madam Speaker, that late notice is unfair, and it puts the opposition in a situation where we are not able to fashion a very constructive and objective debate on those pieces of legislation, Madam Speaker. And so I want to appeal to the Prime Minister and the government that in future you give sufficient notice so that we can come in here and engage in constructive and objective debates. Madam Speaker, I came in this morning ready to speak, ready to contribute to the debate on all the monies that will be borrowed today, Madam Speaker, to finance the capital and the recurrent expenditure programs of the government. Madam Speaker, I saw this morning or today as yet another opportunity for us as parliamentarians to raise the profile of a parliament, Madam Speaker, that has been victimized, a parliament, Madam Speaker, that has suffered immense damage to its reputation, Madam Speaker, a parliament whose conventions have been violated and disrespected, a parliament where insults and personal attacks have become the order of the day, a parliament in which members blatantly disrespect each other with impunity. And Madam Speaker, it should not take you, as Speaker of the House, to posture as a prefect, a school prefect, or a headmaster, Madam Speaker, to quote unquote, bring honorable men and women into line. We must understand the seriousness of the task that have been given to us by our constituents. We are supposed to lead by example, Madam Speaker. And in recent times, Madam Speaker, when I make the rounds through my constituency, the feedback and the general disposition that people have as it relates to our parliament, Madam Speaker, is one that we would want to forget. But today, Madam Speaker, I think we've done fairly okay in that respect up to this point. 
notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, a short while ago, the Prime Minister and member for, for Mikud South, after having clarified to him what the standing orders were saying, Madam Speaker, he assumed a very defiant posture and he insisted to you and the Honorable House that his position was correct. But it is not my place, Madam Speaker, to interpret the standing orders and to make a pronouncement as to who is correct and who isn't correct. Madam Speaker, our country is in crisis, financially, economically, socially. We have problems. And the problems that confront St. Lucia today, Madam Speaker, cannot be solved and they cannot be addressed by the government alone. St. Lucia is in a situation today where all hands must be on deck. The government alone does not have the answers. Notwithstanding the pronouncements on all the figures that have, been, that have been bandied around by the Prime Minister and the Tourism Minister, Madam Speaker, the situation on the ground in the various communities of our country, that situation is bad. And so the time has come for us on both sides of the political divide to put our politics aside and work objectively for the people of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, the government must set the tone. They must set the pace. But how does a government set the tone for the rest of the nation? How does the government set the tone for the parliament, Madam Speaker, when they pick fights, when they pick fights with any semblance of opposition to the posture of the government? Madam Speaker, I took the other paper and it said borrowing, Madam Speaker, in a certain amount. But where was the details to accompany the amount that is being proposed for borrowing? Madam Speaker, would it be wrong for me to, Madam Speaker, assume that just picking up a piece of paper which says standing order, um, motions, Madam Speaker, the other paper, that the, government be, the money being borrowed by the government will be used for things to give members on the other side political advantage? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, why are we borrowing so much money today? Why is the other paper so devoid of information? We were criticized for borrowing. And I remember sitting on the other side of this parliament. And every time we came to parliament to borrow money to finance the programs of our government, Madam Speaker, we were chided, we were criticized, and some of the most disparaging statements were made right in this parliament, Madam Speaker, to give the impression, not just to people in here, but the wider community, that we were reckless and we were a wicked government plunging St. Lucia into debt after debt after debt situation. So today, Madam Speaker, the government that promised so much, the government that promised ching ching in the pocket, the government that promised that when it, came, when it got into government, it was going to handle a crime situation, is doing even worse than we did, Madam Speaker. But you know what is good about our borrowing, Madam Speaker? You can go into every community in St. Lucia and you can see projects and you can see things that were done with the money that we borrowed. You have been in government for almost two years. What do you have to show for your two years with your level of borrowing? And if we were, Madam Speaker, to extrapolate the figures and to forecast, Madam Speaker, what is coming, it will not be, Madam Speaker, long before this Prime Minister gets the unenviable tag of being the first to take St. Lucia to the IMF. Wow. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, don't be too concerned about what you hear coming from the other side. It is a day for politics. It is a day for MPs to come, Madam Speaker, and convey a particular impression to the populace. But we know differently. And when I go into the constituency, when I drive through the different communities of St. Lucia, the cries on the ground, Madam Speaker, reflect a reality that is not consistent with a lot of what we hear coming from the other side um, of this honorable chamber. Madam Speaker, the revenue streams are not doing well. And that is why the leader of the opposition had to ask the prime minister to come here and make a very categorical statement, Madam Speaker, about the state of the economy. But he refused. But instead, the Prime Minister chose to engage in semantics in terms of the methodology that should be used to put questions to him. I think St. Lucians would have been happy today
to hear the Prime Minister stand in this honorable chamber and tell a nation that is crying out for help, crying out for mercy, that these are the things he has in the pipeline and these are the benefits that we are reaping today. But Madam Speaker, again, it is politics. Again, it is an opportunity to come here and say things that are convenient to the, to the heirs. But we know differently, Madam Speaker, and it will not be much longer before the people of St. Lucia, whom you promised so much, will call on you, will call on you to show slate for what you have done with their time when they entrusted you with the responsibility of looking after the well-being and welfare of this nation. Madam Speaker, in a time when money is not forthcoming, the government, as I alluded to, must lead from the front. We have to embrace belt tightening measures. We have to show prudence with the finances of the nation, Madam Speaker. And when you can have ministers with phone bills in excess of $10,000, Madam Speaker, this is sending the wrong message to the rest of the population. Madam Speaker, we have a situation in Denry South where the previous administration proceeded to install lighting fixtures on the Denry playing field. Madam Speaker, close to two years, the lights cannot be connected in Denry. And the word on the street is that, the word on the street, Madam Speaker, is that the light, lighting fixtures in Denry are deemed inferior for that particular constituency by the line minister, and that those lights have to be, Madam Speaker, transferred to another community, and I'm hearing that is supposed to go to Fonsor. So, Madam Speaker, here we are again in borrowing mode. Here we are again with a government that promised ching ching in the pocket. Here we are again with a government that promised so much, Madam Speaker, for the people of St. Lucia. But all we get today, Madam Speaker, are promises of I will do and we will do and this is going to come. The people of St. Lucia cannot wait any longer. The people of St. Lucia are crying out for help. The people of St. Lucia are crying out for relief. And the time has come, Madam Speaker, for this government to rise to the occasion and deliver on the promises that you made to the people of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, with these few words, I want to thank you for your indulgence, Madam Speaker. And I'm hoping that in the next motion, um, I will have an opportunity to say a lot more with respect to the finances of the country at the moment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Member for Babylon. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I sat and listened, and I'm asking myself, am I hearing correctly? Based on the presentation by my colleagues on the other side, and it's unfortunate that they would have to take that direction, Madam Speaker, because like was said by my colleague from Ancillary Canaries, would expect them to come here and give us some recommendations as to how we can improve things. We expect them to come here and to, to criticize and to, to, di to diagnose what we have presented and to give recommendations as to how we can make things better, Madam Speaker. But when I listen to the members on the other side, Madam Speaker, nothing substantial came out from the discussion. Nothing substantial. All we are hearing is things that happened four, five, six, seven, eight years ago. We're moving forward, Madam Speaker. We're moving forward. And since that, that's the tone they have set, Madam Speaker, please allow me to clarify some of the issues and discussions that have been presented here today. Because, Madam Speaker, when I sat and I listened, I said, let me do some research quick, quickly to really understand and appreciate what's happening. And, Madam Speaker, I went to the Prime Minister's budget statement, page seven, Madam Speaker, page seven of the Prime Minister's budget statements, 
I'm not my prime minister. I'm referring to the prime minister of the previous government. The budget statement of 2015. And the document of the House, Madam Speaker, so I don't have to make it a document of the House. Because the member for Castries East said that things were improving. We got an economy that is improving. And things was rosy, and now we have come in and they have made it worse, Madam Speaker. But I'm sure he remember, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, I never said so. I never said, and the, and the, the member must, must stop me in the house. I said things were improving, but the economy needed, needed restructuring. But things were improving. That's what I said. I never said things were rosy. Because it's misleading the house. The point of order. I have said before that when any member rises, you speak to the standing order that you are rising on. That indicates to the person who is on the floor at the moment whether it is a position where they can yield to you or they wish to yield to you. I have said that too many times in the House. So. Proceeding, um, in proceeding, I think unless, unless we may have two mics on at the, at the same time, but then let the other member ref refer to the standing order, then the person standing on his feet can determine how I can rule whether it is a point of order which to yield or a point of order for which it is just a clarification and the person standing may not yield if he or she chooses. Please proceed, Honorable Minister Fagrin. Madam Speaker, I yield because I give a lot of respect to the member from Castries East. I see him, I'm seeing him as a very um, experienced member in this Honorable House. And I, I expect that when he said he would stand on a point of order, he would actually stand on a point of order. But as anything else, he just starts standing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Madam Speaker, if I can continue. <laughs> the Prime Minister in his budget address of 2015, Madam Speaker, page 7, and I quote, 2.1, International Economy Development. And like I said, it's a, it's a document of the House. And I quote, in 2014, the global economy grew by 3.4%, largely reflecting development in advanced economies. So what that is saying, Madam Speaker, hurt is we have a situation in the world where the economy is growing, where things are progressing, unlike, Madam Speaker, that during the period when we were there in 2006 to 2011. Let's make that comparison unlike that period. But of course, the member from Castries is used the economic review, the economic and social review of 2016. And conveniently, Madam Speaker, he's quoting sections that he thinks would be in his favor. But here is what we inherited, Madam Speaker. And I want to go to page three of the Economic Review 2016. And page three, table one, Madam Speaker, look at the situation as far as the global economy. And what is saying that, Madam Speaker, in 2012, we saw a growth of 3.4%. In 2013, we saw a growth of 3.3%. In 2014, like the Prime Minister said in his budget address of 2015, we saw a growth of 3.4%. In 2015, Madam Speaker, 3.2%. In 2016, 
and 2016, 3.1%. 2 that is the situation as far as the world economy is concerned. That is the situation the St. Lucia Labour Party governed this country as far as when you compare to our period 2006 to 2011. Madam Speaker, let's look at the region. Let's look at the region. And that's table two of that same document, page four. And the regional situation is saying that, Madam Speaker, in Barbados, in 2015, the Belgian economy realized growth of 0.88%, 2015. But what happened in 2016? We saw an increase in the performance. We saw an increase in the performance as far as Barbados is concerned, from 0 0.88 to 1.7 in 2015. Guyana, Madam Speaker, Guyana. In 2015, we saw 3.21 percent growth, and in 2016, it went up to 4.0. 3% growth, Madam Speaker. So here it is, if you want to compare St. Lucia with the rest of the world or with the region, we are seeing that they are doing good. The other countries in the region are doing good. Let's look at countries we will say would have the same economic development like St. Lucia, Madam Speaker. And I'm referring to countries under the ECCU, Dominica, Antigua, and these countries. In 2016, Madam Speaker, Anguilla realized growth of 4.5%. Antigua Barbuda realized growth of 4.3%. Dominica, 1.5%, Madam Speaker. Grenada, 1.7%. Monstrat, 1.3%. St. Kitts Nevis, Madam Speaker, 2.8%. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 2.8%. Now, I give that background, Madam Speaker to show that what we heard from the member from Castries is, is incorrect. It's incorrect. Because that same document is showing that, Madam Speaker, that same document is showing on page 6, Madam Speaker, that St. Lucia growth for 2016 was 0.9%. One compared to 2015 of 1.9%. So, you know what I'm showing? That is showing that the country is on a decline. That's what it's showing. That is what it's showing. So, let's lose the figure. The country is on a decline. So, when we came in, Madam Speaker, we got a country on a decline, despite the fact, despite the fact, Madam Speaker, that we are seeing that all the other countries are growing. These are the facts. These are the facts. So when I heard a member from Castries, he's is talking about we got a country that was doing well, Madam Speaker. I'm asking myself, what is he speaking about? What is he speaking about, Madam Speaker? He, he has that document. It's a document of the House. And all of them, they have that document, Madam Speaker. And I'm sure they would agree with me that we inherited something that is not a situation that we would like to find ourselves in. Madam Speaker, I'm still going to, through this document on page 48. Page 48 of the document, expenditure performance. And that's why you have to come here, this Madam Speaker, and continue to borrow. And I'll come to this. That's why you have to come to continue to borrow. Page 48 of the document, Madam Speaker, expenditure performance. And it reads, total expenditure, which accounts for 2.7% of GDP, expanded by 3.1% in 2016. Expenditure expanded. It, you'll spend more. You'll borrow more. Current 
revenue expenditure, Madam Speaker, increase by 6% to almost $100 million. That is what we inherited in 2016 when we came in, Madam Speaker. And that's why the Minister of Finance has to go and borrow. You have to go and borrow. Madam Speaker, when you look at the draft, the graph, sorry, a table in 26 of, of page 52, no, page 51, what we are seeing, Madam Speaker, between 2005 to 2016, public debt increased under the St. Lucia Labour Party. The, the figures are there, page 25. Look at when you all came in, where was the public debt? And when you left in 2016, where it was? It has increased under you all. And that is why we have to come here, Madam Speaker, and borrow to pay off that debt, to pay off the interest on the loans, to pay off the interest on the bonds. That's why we have to come here, Madam Speaker. That's why we have to come here, to pay off. We have to also come here, Madam Speaker, to continue the project they started. And I listened to the member from Castle, from, from Vufort, not from Vufort, Denry North. I thought he would have said, thank you very much, Mr. Madam, Madam, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Mr. Finance, for continuing the project in the Denry North Water Project. I thought you would have said that today. Because we come here, you know, and talk about borrowing, you know, and then the member for Cassius is talking about we have to be borrowing to pay off debts, you know. You should, when you start up, you have said thank you very much, and should continue thanking this government for continuing the projects, not like what you all did. And I'm coming to you in a while about, about fields, you know. Madam Speaker, what we have seen in six months? What have we seen in this country in six months? after my Prime Minister and our Prime Minister, the Minister, Prime Minister of St. Lucia, presented his estimates and his policies. We have seen a reduction in unemployment. That's a fact. A reduction in unemployment. We have seen, Madam Speaker, the increase in sales in six months. That's right. The increase in, you can split it how you want. The figures are saying that there was an increase in sales. That's what the figure is saying, Madam Speaker. That's what we have seen. We have seen an increase in tourism arrivals. That's what we have seen in six months, Madam Speaker. And we have seen an increase in agricultural performance, Madam Speaker. That's what we have seen in six months. So, Madam Speaker, when you're asking, for, you're, you're asking questions and you want answers, Madam Speaker, Let's look at what was said by my Prime Minister when he, when he presented in this Honorable House, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we inherited something, a, 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 a situation, Madam Speaker, that was dismal. Page 9 of Prime Minister Alan Shastley budget address, Madam Speaker. What did he reveal? He revealed to this honorable house and the country that the ease of doing business in St. Lucia went down significantly from 34 in 2008 to 86 in 2016. Who was the government during that time? Things was nice? Who was the government during that time? And Madam Speaker, in this document, the document of my Prime Minister, he said, we need four years to turn things around. That's what he said. That's right. So we have started, Madam Speaker. Yes, we just come out of the We have started, and we go give a report at the end of this financial year. That's when we go give a report. So, this, this. so Madam Speaker, I heard a lot about victimization. Victimization, victimization. And honestly, I wanted to stay away from that topic. I want to stay away from that topic. But I need to clear the air on that. And when I finish, Madam Speaker, I'm hoping that those on the other side do not bring this in the Honorable House. What year did victimization started, Madam Speaker? What year did victimization started? Madam Speaker, I remember the United Workers Party running a gov uh, uh, elections, and members on the other side run against the United Workers Party. And after they lose badly, the government reemployed them. The Pilgrims, the Satnis, the Gaspers. We employ them in the government service. 
We, we employ Lansiko because that's how we behave as a government. We employ Lansiko. You know? What happened with Mr. Lawrence in 1997? who ran for ancillary canaries, Mr. Lawrence, who was the manager of the fisheries complex. When he lost, when he went to the fisheries complex, what was told to him? Move from there. You run against us. That's where victimization started, Madam Speaker. Affirmative action. Affirmative action. Well, don't even go for affirmative action yet. Siberia. Who created Siberia, Madam Speaker? Who created Siberia? Move persons they believe not supporting them and put them in a little unit and bring in persons on the other side, a top-level position in the in civil service. Who started that, Madam Speaker? It's not this party. It's not this party. So you want to ask question about victimization? You know what about victimization? Spider didn't fire you. Spider didn't fire you. The spider didn't fire you. You know? You know about victimization? You try and fire him. You try and fire him. You, you, you try and fire him. Siberia, Madam Speaker. Affirmative action. Affirmative action, Madam Speaker. Where did they pass affirmative action? Where? You know where well, this World Cup they're talking about. Where did they pass affirmative action, Madam Speaker? Where? Babono. And when the late George Odlam spoke against it, what did they do to him as a member of the party? Affirmative action, Madam Speaker. Are we talking about victimization, Madam Speaker? In recent times, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister and myself went to court. Why? Because they try and cut the head of the United Workers' Party. You talk about victimization? You all sat in the cabinet and agreed to take the Prime Minister and myself to court because you all say we, we spend constituency monies badly. And you know what's, what's about it, Madam Speaker? They brought poor persons from Babylon to court. I remember a lady who served on the constituency council, a respectable lady, cried to me. Cry to me and tell me, look, all the years she has never been in a courthouse. And the St. Lucia Labour Party took her to the courthouse because of victimization, Madam Speaker. You know about victimization? But that did not break us. The workers at City Council. That did not break us. That made us stronger. And that's why you're all where you all are today. That's why you're where you all are today. You know about projects? You know about projects in Denryville? You're the ministers, youth and sports. What happened to the Baladar field lights? <laughs> Up to now, it's not on. We're trying to put it on. Talk about lights? You want to come here and talk about lights? You want to come and talk about unfinished projects by the, by the, by the United Workers Party? One and a half year in our government? What happened to the Timon court? What happened to the Balata court? Under your watch? We're well, not come here. Be careful what you'll see. Be careful what you'll see you'll come here. What happened to the government field? What happened to the government field? All these under your watch as Minister of Youth and Sports. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Madam Speaker, when you stand up here and talk about the government needs to set the tool, we have set the tool. We have given you policies which we believe and we are confident, Madam Speaker, will turn things around. You have to diagnose and analyze the policies and come here and tell us how you think you can do it better. But you know what? They have no answers. They have nothing to say. All we have to come and say is victimization and victimization and victimization. You know? That's all we have to come here and say, Madam Speaker. So I want to say, Madam Speaker, that I support this resolution. And I know that my government, under the leadership of Mr. Honorable Alan Shaste, we are in the right direction. And we have a cabinet of ministers who focuses on the job to be done. And whatever we have accomplished so far in the Ministry of Agriculture is not my doing, it's the doing of the government and my cabinet ministers. I want to say thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, um, I kindly request that we take a recess. Um, for one hour for lunch break until 3.15. Honorable members, the question is that the House do rise for lunch break until 3.15. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. 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 As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. 
This House stands suspended until 3.15.